So, 13.02 in my clock here. Um, a warm welcome to all of you, dear contributors, dear participants. My name is Wolfgang König. I am the executive director of the Goethe University's House of Finance. On behalf of Goethe University in Frankfurt, on behalf of the House of Finance, the Leibniz Institute SAFE, and the Institute for Banking and Financial History, I warm-heartedly welcome you all to today's conference on international banking networks, colon, sources of stability or instability, question mark, evidence from the past and the present. I would especially like to welcome Professor Catherine Schenk, Oxford University, holder of this year's visiting professorship, Financial History at Goethe University Frankfurt. Professor Schenk, please let me say how much we are looking forward to having you here in Frankfurt, not only virtually, and to welcome you in the Goethe Universities and House of Finances communities. I would like to thank you for putting together the today's program with highly esteemed speakers, to whom I also want to extend my sincere and our sincere thanks for their contributions to the conference. Since the last financial crisis, an increasing number of academics and practitioners have been taken interest in the long-term historical perspective on the financial system and its current problems. This is also true, certainly true for today's audience. As much as we regret that we can only meet virtually today, we are delighted that this format allows us a truly worldwide audience to attend the conference. Thank you all for being here today. We owe a great deal of gratitude to our donors of the Visiting Professorship Financial History at Goethe University, the Metzler Bank and the Friedrich Flick Förder Stiftung, who also made today's conference possible. I would like to thank our donors for supporting us so enthusiastically and for being such a reliable partner to Goethe University and to the House of Finance. Before I now also welcome and hand over to Kim Kompel, member of the Partners Committee of the Bankhaus Metzler, for his welcome address from the donor side, let me thank Hannah Floto Degener and her SAFE supporters and our SAFE supporters for perfectly having organized this event and will be organizing this event. And now, please, Kim, may I hand over the floor to yours? Yeah, thank you. Thanks also very warm, sorry, very warm welcome from uh, my side. Obviously, we are very pleased to have this conference uh, today on an, on, on an online uh, matter, so to speak, or an online conference, especially after last year's event actually got suspended or to obviously the, uh, the Corona uh, crisis. Uh, Metzler or Bankhaus Metzler and our partner um, Friedrich Flick uh, foundation, we are jointly supporting the guest professorship. And I just thought to give you maybe sort of three reasons why uh, we are doing this. There are obviously many reasons, many more reasons, uh, but I think that's sort of the, the three uh, most important ones behind our own thinking. Um, first of all, it probably is, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Bankhaus Metzler or Metzler Bank, uh, we've been founded in 1674. We are still owned uh, by the same family, 12th generation. Uh, so history is actually something which obviously is in our genes. Uh, I think we understand and value uh, financial history research. And um, if, if I look at our own strategy and if I look at our own thinking, we also use this and try to draw lessons, so to speak, what have we experienced uh, and actually take this forward uh, to our own strategy uh, going forward. So I think that's an important part uh, from the thinking. Um, the other bit is that the, the, the Metzler family always has been very close to Goethe University. Metzler family is actually one of the founding, um, uh, one of the founding members of, the, of Goethe University back in 1914. So education, education of young people, education of students is something which is very close to, uh, to our heart. Um, and therefore supporting you know, this visitor uh, uh, guest professorship 
uh, is, 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 is very, you know, is, as I said, is very important to us. And the last point I would like to raise, um, it's, I think it's also about exchange uh, and exchange and communication an exchange in the way of uh, international exchange. So Catherine coming over, hopefully one day, hopefully next year. Um, but Catherine coming over, um, having this international exchange, in a way it's also an intercultural exchange, which I think is very important. Um, and also communication um, is, is, is an, more, an important matter to us. And obviously, I mean, we, I think we all would agree that these are important factors there were important factors, there are important factors, and there will be important uh, going forward. Um, and so, you know, there are many good reasons why we support this, but I think these three, looking at it from these three aspects, uh, this is how we do it and, and why we think uh, it's, it's, it's a really good um, uh, program. Um, and we are also, if, if you look around, I mean, we're doing this now since uh, 2014, the, the response has, ex, has been extremely positive. Um, and so we obviously are also very pleased uh, with that. And, you know, let me maybe finish by saying, uh, Professor Schenk, we are very much looking forward to see you and meet you in Frankfurt next year. Yeah, we were hoping last year, we were uh, hoping this year, but I'm sure next year it's, it's actually going to take place. Uh, and I wish all of you and all of us a very interesting uh, conference today. Thank you very much, uh, Kim and Wolfgang. Um, I am very regretful that we're not able to meet in person, um, but I also am lo really looking forward to coming to Frankfurt. It was a great honor uh, to be chosen as the visiting professor uh, for the scheme. Um, and indeed, Frankfurt is the perfect place for my kind of work where I hope to bring together academics, uh, central bankers, bankers, historians, and economists into fruitful um, exchange and, and uh, dialogue. Um, and that really was the purpose behind the program that we built uh, for this conference today. Um, so as Wolfgang said, after the great financial crisis, uh, there was a renewed interest in uh, both the strengths and weaknesses of the international banking networks and that process of globalization, uh, the identification of systemically important financial institutions, prompting different kinds of regulatory responses. Um, so in a sense, we see these networks as being as sources of resilience um, and liquidity, but also potentially sources of uh, weakness or critical failure. Um, one of the other aspects of the great financial crisis has been a huge upsurge in interest um, in history and in financial and banking history in particular. There was already a large body of work on the 19th century globalization, but also on the interwar uh, eruption of a financial crisis. Um, and I think the, the kind of links between current, uh, current challenges and questions and historical research and new methodologies has really been extraordinarily fruitful. Um, and it's a dialogue I hope that we can see um, here today. Um, the, it now turns to me to uh, introduce Linda Goldberg as our first keynote speaker, and it's an enormous personal as well as professional pleasure uh, for me to do so. Uh, Linda is the Senior Vice President, a Senior Vi Vice President at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, um, but she came out of the Bronx um, and uh, headed to City University of New York uh, for her education, and then directly on to Princeton, obviously a high flyer with a rapid trajectory, um, and then to the Reserve Bank of New York, where she's been since 1995. Um, in 2012, she co-founded with Claudia Buch, who will be speaking uh, later this afternoon, uh, the International Banking Research Network. So her research interests and her leadership in, uh, in academic as well as central banking really fits so perfectly with my own interests, but also the interests of this conference. I was so pleased that she's been able to attend. Um, and she also spans that central banking to academic um, uh, straddle that I'm, that I'm trying to promote um, as a visiting professor at Princeton at University of Pennsylvania and at NYU. Um, she tops the uh, top 1% of, uh, of economists, according to citations, um, and she's particularly renowned for her work on uh, international liquidity, international banking, 
and more laterally, the SWATS network uh, and her research has been really profoundly influential. So without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to invite uh, Linda to uh, address us. Thank you for that very kind and warm introduction. So, um, you know, I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to this audience today. Um, you know, the conference around the GoTo University visiting professorship of financial history, and in particular with it being held by Catherine Schenk. Um, I actually first heard about this exciting program in a time and in a place that illustrates not just the importance of research on international banking networks, but also the importance of networks of international banking researchers. Um, it was in December 2018 at a small Christmas dinner hosted by Claudia Buch in Wiesbaden. And seated beside me, beside me at dinner was Stephanie Collet, who's here right now, um, who I had not previously met. And we started to converse on international financial history. And she described this very initiative on which we meet today. Um, Stephanie queried me about who I thought could be a great match for the fellows program. I replied, Catherine Schenk. Um, and indeed, Catherine was already in their sights. And here we all are today at the very event coincidentally discussed more than two years ago. So networks of all kinds um, can be uh, informative and impactful. So uh, my remarks today uh, will discuss themes in international spillovers and coordination through global banking, um, also through central banking. I will start with one form of cooperation specifically um, in times of elevated stress, that's the network of central bank swap lines, where my comments will focus on liquidity management across international banking networks. I will then pivot to a more medium term and forward looking perspective, um, as research on international banking networks provides lessons that are important for the roles that global banks might play in economic recoveries across countries from the pandemic. Uh, my remarks are, um, I speak on my own behalf and not on behalf of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. Um, and my short remarks will draw on a series of papers um, by myself and uh, co-authors. So we'll, I'll just leave those up for, for the moment. That's for the first part of the talk. So let's go to the, the topic of global banks, management of liquidity internationally and central bank swap lines. So international banking networks generate cross-border capital flows. Large banks engage in cross-border lending to other banks and to both public and private sector borrowers. Some of these large banks are also global banks with branches and subsidiaries established in foreign countries. Um, some of the benefits and challenges of these types of organizations, um, you know, as, as Catherine was alluding to, um, are discussed in a recent paper by myself and Claudia in the annual review of financial economics. I think that came out um, maybe August of, of last year. Now, in the United States, important roles are played by the hosted branches of foreign banking organizations referred to as FBOs. And those roles are particularly in providing credit and financial services to con commercial and industrial sector customers. They also provide extensive backstop financing for their clients via off balance sheet credit commitments. So think of uh, lines of credit. Um, U.S. FBO branches, so the hosted branches of foreign banking organizations, fund their activities in part through insured retail deposits that they get from corporations and uninsured, rather, retail deposits from corporations and money market funds. As these hosted branches are part, legally part of the parent banking organization, the liquidity and capital of the foreign parent banks are the primary shock absorbers for the branches in the US. 
The parent banking organizations, though, often manage liquidity globally, allocating funding internally across locations according to the needs and business strategies of their organizations. So it's informative to think of these funding and liquidity networks in the global financial crisis and in the recent pandemic period um, with a, you know, a history theme, but a very narrow one that's um, just since um, the 2000s. Um, and also to see the roles ultimately played by dollars that became available through central bank um, reciprocal current, or currency arrangements or swap lines. So let's start with the global financial crisis. Um, in the global financial crisis, some European banks experienced difficulties in meeting their dollar funding needs. Many of those banks with US branches initially turned to these branches to source more dollars. This form of cross-border lending within banking organizations falls under the heading of internal capital markets. Once the central bank swap lines were activated and dollar funding availability broadened through the central banks, the private banks instead met their dollar liquidity needs through their own central banks. Indeed, um, in the global financial crisis, the outstanding balances at the central bank swap facilities peaked at over $580 billion and are widely credited with reducing dollar funding market strains. Rolling forward to this pandemic period, in March 2020, as the pandemic uh, accelerated, the importance of cross-border liquidity through internal capital markets of global banks was again demonstrated. So let's focus specifically on the part in the United States around the US branches of foreign banking organizations. Before the crisis, before the pandemic uh, hit in early 2020, these FBO branches had outstanding commitments like lines of credit, which totaled nearly $1 trillion or about 40% of the branch balance sheets on average. This is the part in the United States, so about $1 trillion. The onset of the COVID-19 shock in March, 2020 brought large changes to their balance sheets. Many of these branches saw sizable usage of committed credit lines by US-based customers resulting in increased branch funding needs. So this is when the corporate credit uh, funding markets were disrupted. Now, foreign parent banks, consistent with the structure defined by regulatory arrangements for where liquidity is housed, met these needs by sending dollars across borders to their US branches. This added demand to offshore dollar funding markets alongside new demands for precautionary, li precautionary liquidity, some called this a dash for cash, and other strains associated with the role of non-banks, which may be in addressed in Inyaki's paper a little later today. So what of the official liquidity response and consequences? Um, two pieces for the Liberty Street Economic Series of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York um, on the slide provide some details. So the network of central bank swap lines with the Federal Reserve provided dollar liquidity. Um, here, some of the key announcements uh, that took place in March, 2020 are presented on this slide. These included addressing the cost of the swaps, the tenors of funds that were made available through swaps, the frequency of operations, and the span of the swap lines um, as there are uh, standing uh, swap central banks, Bank of Canada, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, ECB, Swiss national banks, and then temporary uh, swap lines um, that also were activated. So um, in addition, a new uh, what's known as FEMA repo facility was introduced 
and made broadly available to official account owners with the Federal Reserve. So this Foreign International Monetary Authority, FEMA uh, facility, enables official account holders with the Federal Reserve to borrow against their foreign currency reserves, and those are typically held in US treasuries. So these arrangements mitigate market stresses through a number of channels. They allow foreign commercial banks to access US dollar liquidity through their swap, their central banks, obviating the need to bid up rates in the private market. They help maintain the provision of credit, including the funding of credit drawdowns by firms. And they help avoid fire sales of US assets that may otherwise be required to generate dollar liquidity, just thus reducing amplification mechanisms. So the Fed's FEMA repo facility, together with central bank dollar swaps, appear to have re reduced the need of other central banks to sell assets out of their foreign country, currency reserves to obtain liquidity and dollars to support the funding needs of their local entities. Without access to US dollar liquidity backstops, foreign institutions may have continued precautionary sales of US dollar assets and amplified stress in US credit and other financial markets. The suite of policy actions taken by the FOMC helped stabilize US dollar funding markets. One measure of strains, which is the FX swap basis shown on slide four, sharply declined over the course of March, 2020. The suite of actions um, that I mentioned also supported the flow of credit to the US economy, um, as it's discussed in detail in the June piece on the Liberty Street Economic Series that I previously showed. So let's turn more now to the more medium term and consider the international networks of banks as potential supports or hindrance to recoveries. For this purpose, um, think about first the path of economic activity. The global economy experienced an extreme yet common negative, highly negative economic shock from COVID-19. Central banks and government, governments around the world uh, deployed extensive toolkits in a sharp and ultimately pretty synchronized way. Um, and among the changes that were made were ones that were di directly targeted at bank activities. And this included um, re reduced macroprudential buffers and relaxed con counterparty concentration limits. Um, plus, there was a relaxation of borrower-based tools that included allowing a higher loan-to-value um, and debt-to-income ratio for households and small businesses experiencing temporary financial stress, distress. Um, and the, this kind of uh, prevalence of how macroprudential tools were relaxed is nicely illustrated in this IMF exhibit by Neer and Olofsson. Um, and as we know, fiscal guarantee schemes to support the real economy were also used extensively, delaying or moderating uh, loan losses on bank balance sheets. So this leads to um, thinking uh, now about asynchronous recoveries and policy normalizations. So one year later, with news of virus variants and progress on vaccinations, expectations tilt towards asynchronous economic recoveries. The timing um, and extent of recoveries and the speed of normalization of macroprudential and other policies raise important questions of how international capital flows through banks will respond. So a key question here is whether spillovers through global banks will support local recoveries. Um, so international spillovers. So the global liquidity flows through both banks and non-banks are driven by so-called global factors and local factors, which include uh, different policy tools. Let me just uh, pull this back up. Um, so foreign global banks emerged from the pandemic with stronger balance sheets um, and could be a source of credit inflows into a broader number of economies. Um, 
especially if domestic banks end up with a reduced ability to expand their balance sheets and provide lending, foreign capital flows can support economic recovery. These are some of the themes um, in these articles that I put up here with um, Claudia Buch and Matthew Boussier. Um, so historically, positive spillovers through global banks are more likely when these banks are better capitalized and have more robust liquidity. And generally, um, as I've shown in this uh, top paper with uh, BIS co-authors, uh, better capitalized banks tend to be less flighty lenders and absorb bigger stresses. Now the International Banking Research Network, which Catherine um, already introduced, has done work using micro banking data that informs questions about what happens um, in international flows around changes in prudential policy instruments. The main takeaway is consistent with what I just mentioned. The direction and magnitude of international flows of credit can differ by policy instrument and be influenced by the balance sheet conditions of banks at home compared with foreign global banks. In practice, and I'll just, um, I'm, you know, the lessons, by the way, um, there's a series of papers uh, that were published in the International Journal of Central Banking, March 2017, and you could see um, the span of country participants um, in this one particular initiative, and we've had other initiatives as well. Okay, so um, now in practice, the spillover effects of changes in prudential measures on cross-border lending can be positive or negative. For example, well-capitalized banks for which tighter prudential requirements are less binding. Um, so if you've tightened your prudential requirements, what happens uh, domestically and to foreign banks? Um, the well-capitalized banks have tended to expand their market shares internationally and lend more internationally than weaker banks when another country tightens. So related evidence comes from Canada's experience and that of Germany and the US. US banks and German banks lending through their bank branches in host countries did not change significantly when the foreign parent country tightened capital requirements. But for banks for both countries, the type of prudential instrument mattered. For example, global banks contracted lending to foreign countries that raised local reserve requirements, while they did not react much to changes in loan to value or concentration ratios abroad. Changes in prudential instruments can also shift market shares between dom domestic and global banks. So studies of Canadian, French, Italian, and Dutch banks point to a positive spillover effect, that is that foreign banks' foreign lending growth, growth tended to increase as prudential instruments abroad tightened. Foreign banks gained market share when, tight, when requirements tightened, either because they were not directly affected by the stricter regulations or because the regulations were less bank, binding for these banks. And it's the well-capitalized banks that may have used the opportunity to expand their international presence when other countries increased capital ratios and constrained the activities of local banks. So what does that mean for this kind of forthcoming period? It means that as we look to finance, um, you know, the, the very important recoveries um, in all of our countries, the kind of policy spillovers that occur through global banks will be shaped by bank characteristics, the macro environment, and the types of policy instruments that are changed through the trajectory of um, our normalization and recovery periods. So numerous regulatory and coordination issues are raised um, by the response of global banks to changes in policy. It's important to monitor these responses for a better understanding of how policies interact with banks' ability uh, to support economic recovery. In some cases, uh, the global banks will potentially play an important role um, when domestic banks are, have particularly weak balance sheet 
conditions and then focus on um, you know, basically the, the um, strengthening their balance sheets and recapitalizing. Um, you know, these could be very complementary um, paths forward. Um, but monitoring that takes place should make use of the extensive infrastructures and institutions that have been put into place. Um, all of this looking even further forward can profit in terms of access to microdata, um, stress testing frameworks that really have shown their value, uh, methodological improvements uh, in the policy community, but also in the private side on kind of risk management, and certainly on networks of international researchers and um, established modes of cooperation uh, among national authorities. Um, so that will conclude my remarks. Um, I thank you for your attention. And I very much look forward to hearing the presentations through today. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I think you've really set the agenda um, in an excellent way. Um, I'm pulling out a couple of themes that I know will be coming up um, both in the first session, the historical session, and also the more contemporary session later this afternoon. Um, importantly, the uh, importance of internal capital markets within banks, and there's a lot of research being done there um, across the 20th century. Um, Cross-border capital flows and that local uh, versus, uh, versus global or local versus foreign um, will arise uh, in, a, in, a, in a several of the presentations to come. Um, I think this coordination issue um, and pacing and the asynchronous uh, recovery, but also asynchronous uh, back of prudential relaxation and tightening um, is a really an interesting um, aspect uh, to be thinking at and again can be tested historically um, as well. Um, and finally, I'd make another bid for the micro data uh, uh, analysis um, that the International Bank for the International Banking Research Network is doing but that many of our historical papers are also drawing on um, historically uh, bank level data, uh, which is more publicly accessible. Um, so thank you very much, Linda. I think we'll move um, directly on it. We're kind of short for time, unfortunately, but, uh, but hopefully in the questioning, um, these themes uh, that Linda will be, be willing to come back in um, in some of the discussions after the sessions. So we'll move on to the first um, academic session. Um, and we have two papers on um, the uh, first globalization, um, the uh, late 19th and very early 20th centuries, and two papers on the interwar period. Um, so the first paper is uh, with being presented by uh, Wilfred Kisling, um, but is joint with Chris Meissner from UC Davis um, and Shenzhou Xi Xu from uh, Stanford um, Business School. So Wilfred, can I uh, invite you to begin? Uh, yes, sure. Um, I will share my screen. I hope that works. Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, well, hello everyone, also for me. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. We are very happy to present here today at this wonderful panel. And as uh, Catherine already said, this is joint work with Chen Zik Xu and Chris Meisner. Uh, and they would have loved to join today, but uh, 4 a.m. in the morning was a rather challenging time. <laughs> So they sent their best, uh, but it's only me. Um, so, wait, does that work? So the topic uh, of this conference is um, risk and benefits of international banking networks. And our paper has a more positive approach. So we're looking at the benefits. Um, and as the title indicates, our central question is, do banks shape international trade? Uh, or better, how much do they shape trade? And the short answer is yes, we believe they do uh, shape trade uh, and indeed quite considerably. So this graph here shows you the world exports and number of bank connections in the world between 1850 and 1913. So what we mean with uh, bank connections is either uh, a sending country has a bank and a receiving country the other way around or both uh, at the same time. And by the end uh, of this presentation, I have hopefully convinced you that this positive correlation we can see here reflects the importance of banks in being a decisive force in shaping international trade uh, during the first globalization. 
And this is our very own data, and I will come back to this uh, a bit later. So we're looking at the first globalization, uh, which was characterized by increasing market integration and by increasing international trade. Um, and the world's leading economy at that time was the UK. And until the second half of the 19th century, what they did, they financed their trade mainly via the merchant banks. But then with increasing trade flows and flows of capital and goods, uh, there was the need for more adequate financial institutions. So um, the UK started to um, install their first foreign banks. In addition, the UK was disposing over the central hub uh, and, and key center discounting center uh, at this time, London City. Uh, and also on top of it, they had the sterling, which was dominating the international markets as a key currency for trade. So in short, or in other words, any competitor in the UK in the international trade markets was to some extent quite financially uh, dependent on the UK. Uh, and that's why we can see in the second half of the 19th century, countries like uh, France and the US, but also particularly Germany, had the idea to establish their own first financial networks, their banking networks, that would give them the financial independence from London and from the UK, and hence can be an adequate tool to, to challenge the UK dominance in the international trade markets. But this brings us to the question, do banks actually influence trade? So we know um, about certain uh, technologies, for example, that have a positive impact on transport costs. We also know that uh, certain institutions and legal frameworks have the ability or the capability to boost international trade. Uh, but what seems missing uh, is in our understanding of the international trade dynamics is the specific or more detailed role, uh, role of banks. And if we look at banks, um, we can roughly say there are three channels through which they might or have the ability to influence trade. The first one being the classical idea of increasing uh, credit, providing credit. Uh, the second one by lowering payments and, and contractual frictions. Uh, and finally, they improve information flows and hence diminish information asymmetries. And uh, they do that as qualitative studies show by going abroad and providing their customers uh, with detailed information over market conditions, uh, competitors, um, and so on. So banks being important, uh, banks having the ability to influence trade flows, and banks being an alternative to London, these are the main ideas we want to um, bring you here, trying to convince you here today. So coming back to the idea of the very first graph of um, showing foreign banks and trade, this one here compares um, the world exports of those countries having a bank location, uh, having a bank connection. So the exporting country has a bank in the importing country or the other way around or at the same time with those um, that don't uh, dispose of a such bank connection. And we can see, clearly see that the dark blue line is higher in particular uh, by the end of the second half um, of the 19th century when like France, uh, Germany, and the US started to engage in international banking, um, we can see the dispersing happening here. So uh, just to point out at this very moment, because I believe we will have a wonderful presentation of this a bit later today, um, we do not question that London was very, very important in financing international trade. What we rather want to show here or to convince you and provide new evidence uh, that having disposing over an own international financial network um, was an additional advantage in the competition in international trade, mar uh, trade markets. So it completes the pictures. Uh, it does not substitute it, okay? Just to upfront that. Um, and the data. So we believe uh, that one of our uh, main contributions or bigger contributions is the complete new data set um, we we collected uh, and created. So what we have, we collected all the bank representations in the world on a city level between 1850s and 1913. Uh, if you sum it up, that's around about 290,000 raw observations. And we're talking about more than 3,000 unique banks uh, that were present in more than 7,000 7, unique cities. Uh, and we distinguish between two types of bank connections. Uh, the first one we call the direct connection. 
uh, that looks at how many banks of each nationality are in one country. So an example would be how many UK bank banks were operating in India and the other way around. And the second one we call uh, indirect uh, connection and that asks uh, which banks share uh, a country. So for example, do both India and China have the same UK bank operating? How these connections, these bank connections influence trade, we're gonna, we're gonna show in our empirical uh, research and empirical approach a bit later. So the data, as I said, has been hand collected from uh, the Banking Almanac, which is an almanac that has been published since the 1815, and I believe it still continues to be published. And it provides information on uh, the location of the bank uh, and the name of the banks. So here you can see an example, in 1891, uh, in Bombay, in the city of Bombay in India, we had several banks, among them the Chartered Mercantile Bank, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, and so on. What a big challenge was, a big challenge was that the Banking Almanac does not provide the nationalities. Um, so what we had to do, we had to assign the nationalities, and we did so by looking at the location of the headquarters of a certain bank. And this information was partly provided in the almanac, but many times you also had to uh, um, uh, look at secondary literature, such as the famous work of uh, Risa et al. Um, and so on. And um, so now this should work. And this map um, shows you all the bank branches in the world in 1871. This one shows you all the branches in the world in 1886. 1900 and 1930. Um, and what uh, we can see here on one hand is uh, the speed of banking expansion. So we're talking about roughly 40 years. So there is a huge boom uh, in particular starting in 1886 and we can see by 1913 banks were everywhere. Um, what we can also can see that in the beginning we have that concentration uh, of banking uh, in Europe and the UK colonies but this picture also changes and we have a more diversification in the spread of banks all over the world. But with some, if you want, uh, some particular focus on the emerging countries of Latin America and, and Asia. And the top five sending countries, so those that exported uh, banks went abroad, were the UK, France, Australia, Germany, Canada, and the USA. Uh, however, we have to say, um, Canada and, and Australia are misleading or outliers because they mainly exported to, to New Zealand uh, and to the US. So uh, what becomes evident also is here that the UK was uh, by far the biggest player um, with dominating nearly the whole, uh, the whole world at the time in terms of branches. But if we have a closer look at um, these top five uh, countries uh, on the left hand side, or the, the left figure shows you the evolution of numbers of banks of these top five between, uh, between 1850 and uh, 1913. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see the very same for the branches. And we do see that the UK is still dominating, but we can see that those countries such as France or Germany are catching up. Okay, so we can see a constant expansion of these. Uh, in the matter of time, interest of time, our empirical strategy has uh, three goals. We want to see the relation between or the role of banks in fostering trade. And we look at three different kinds of trade. So first, we look at the total trade between countries. Second, we look at the directional trade. So this is exports and imports. And then finally, we look at the third party trade, which I will explain in a bit. So we start the whole thing with a classical gravity model of trade, which um, correlates um, total trade with uh, whether or not there was a banking connection between the countries. So we're talking about any bank connections. And the results confirm that uh, banks do have a positive impact and countries of, with a bank connection on average um, tend to trade uh, 32 log points more than those that don't have such a bank connection. This is a bit more clear visually, I guess. We confirm our results with an event study and here you can see the vertical line. Um, so these are the global bank and uh, the world banks and trade for our whole sample. 
And the vertical line is the bank entry. And we can see that in the moment when in a country a bank entry, clearly there was this jump uh, in, in trade. And also what we can see that this is apparently a persistent effect. So not only one time, but it continues over at least 10 years. Um, in the second step, as I said, what we did, we had a look at whether or not uh, we, we have an influence on the direction of trade. So the first example would be export of financing. So um, does Brazil or does the presence of a British bank in Brazil increase the share of British exports to Brazil? So we're looking at the level of trades. And then we flip the whole thing uh, around and have a look whether or not British bank presence in Brazil also um, affects imports to uh, the UK. And in both cases, we can see that positive uh, relationship. Indeed, uh, we also have a positive effect on the direction of trade. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit rushing through, but I think I'm very time limited. So finally, what we have a look at, we were interested in the idea, uh, might it be uh, that also banks uh, have a certain influence on what we call maybe regional trade, in the sense that if uh, a French, French bank, for example, is present in India and in China at the same time, can we see that it affects the trade between these two countries? So the rationale behind that would be that a French bank in India may be more likely to finance an exporter towards China if they have someone in China that is can give information about the market conditions and is trustworthy. So it's basically the idea of uh, banking networks uh, creating trust. And indeed, we can also see that uh, this connection, this bank presence has an impact on this uh, third party trade, what we call it. Um, we also confirm, we also conduct some robustness checks. Um, the first one being a placebo. So where we have the idea or the question is, does it matter um, that an exporter has uh, their own bank in an importing country or can it be any foreign bank? And we find it has to be uh, your bank. Otherwise there's no positive significant effect. And then in the second uh, step, we have a look um, at spatial correlations and we wanna know if um, for example, we compare the trade between an exporting, uh, the trade between exporting and importing country with the trade between the near neighbors of that exporting country to the importing country and have a look if our bank effect still exists or persists and it does. So we exclude the idea that our uh, increase in trade is driven by, by spatial correlation in that sense. And um, as I think I'm out of time, to sum up, uh, we present a new data set on the whole entire universe uh, of international banking from 1850 until 1914. Uh, and we gave first evidence of this uh, positive correlation or this relationship between uh, trade and finance that banks indeed foster trade. Um, so we would say that um, so far, the idea of banks being neglected in that ambition should be taken into account in studying the international um, dynamics of trade. Thank you very much for your attention. And Catherine, I hope I'm still in time. You are just in time. So thank you very much, Wilfred. Um, I'm sorry it was a bit breathless. Um, <laughs> we do have five minutes, however, for questions. That's why I was pushing him along a little bit. Um, and if you wanted to ask a question through the Q&A, um, that would be great. And indeed, we have one already, and I'll announce it for you. So it's from William Allen. and. You conclude that trade follows banks, but could it also be that banks follow trade? So a question of causation. Um, yeah, that's a very good one. So um, we are trying to establish this causality. We still uh, haven't gotten there at this very moment. But if you look at the qualitative evidence, if you look at, um, at Germany and the Deutsche Bank, for example, um, when the Deutsche Bank was established in 1871, in the manifest, actually, they concluded that one of the main aims of this bank was to foster trade. So the idea was that banks were established um, to initiate trade. Um, so we do have some qualitative evidence that um, it was um, that banks went where trade was only marginally developed and hence should have a positive effect on it. Um, but obviously it's also, they wouldn't go somewhere where there's no trade potential. Um, so we are still uh, working on that. Um, 
Uh, we're trying to, to get a bit around with some uh, econometrics, but we still haven't gone there. What we did, we did a counterfactual, and we could see that um, uh, there's a positive effect uh, if there's no bank and so on. But it's a very good question. If you have an uh, IV, we would welcome it very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and indeed, remember to post your uh, questions in the Q&A if you have any further. Um, in the meantime, maybe I could ask you about, um, Wilfred, just to clarify, what do you mean by bank connections? Are you talking about um, branches or agents or how are you calibrating those different kinds of relationships? Uh, yeah, so we, um, that was also a very intensive discussion we had. So we are looking at branches. So we're looking at physical presence. Um, so it's indeed when a bank has um, uh, building up a new bank in another country. Um, because we thought that um, agents wouldn't have the same capacity to provide um, credit and to support um, the, the, the clients as a established bank would be. Um, and then again, it was... Um, it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish between what is an agent and what is a bank, uh, given what the Almanac provides you on, on, uh, on this information. So uh, for, this, for this round, we, we uh, focused on, on the physical presence, but we do know that the correspondent banking also has a, has a big game in it, which would be another, um, another project, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks very much. There's a question from Meng Wu, uh, which is the role of the gold standard in your narratives, does that feature? Uh, well, uh, when we, we, we put it in, as a, in our gravity model and in, in our event studies, we put it as a dummy. So we, we control for it in that sense, in the classical econometrical style that we, we control it in our equation. Um, so, so there is some evidence that uh, the, the gold standard has a positive effect, but. And from Raphael Heim, do you have a sense of which of the sort of routes um, or channels through which banks can foster trade and investment are most important, the information asymmetries or, or what other aspects? Um, so uh, I, I, I rushed a bit, but I said it in the beginning. So we, we defined these three channels. Now that's providing credit uh, and by diminishing uh, um, the information asymmetries and providing information flows. So we can't dis pinpoint down which of the three it is. So we have to, uh, we don't have any information on, on what exactly the banks did on the ground um, because we have all the banks in the world as 270,000. So it's just, uh, it would be a big challenge. Um, so at this point we are going for one of these three it should be. Um, so, but it would be very interesting. We are also on it to try to disentangle a bit. Okay, um, thanks very much. We have some questions still outstanding, but I'm going to um, I'm going to leave them in the in the chat, and maybe you could have a look at them, Wilfred, um, and we'll try to get back uh, back to the questioners. Um, and I think we'll. So thank you, thank you so much um, for a really interesting intervention. Um, we next have up Olivia Accomunati from the London School of Economics, and he has a paper joint with Stefano Ugolini, uh, Delio uh, Lucchese Picero. Uh, so, Olivier, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Um... So, we're staying with the sort of, well, late 19th century, early 20th century, and again with the sort of architecture of the global payment system, uh, looking at bills of exchange. Good, so let me uh, share my screen. Okay, and 15 minutes, uh, Olivier. Yes, I will try to keep the time. Um, well, well, first, thank you uh, so much for inviting me to this great uh, conference. So as you said, this is joint work with Delio, Lucena Piquero, and Stefano Golini. And Stefano is actually with us today, so um, he, he can participate in the discussion afterwards. Uh, so since uh, you asked me, Catherine, to participate in this conference one year ago, the paper I was planning to present has been accepted for publication. Uh, however, uh, that paper is part of a bigger research project on the global money market during the first globalization. So what I'm going to do today is uh, present some results of the accepted paper as well as new and more preliminary uh, results of a follow-up paper we are currently uh, working on. 
Um, so, you know, a question we are all interested in here uh, is how resilient is uh, the international banking system? And this question, of course, has come to the forefront uh, since the great financial crisis, when uh, we realized that problems in the global money market and the failure of small but highly interconnected financial institutions uh, could have far-reaching uh, consequences for the global financial system. And what we are uh, trying to do in this project is uh, to put these questions uh, into a historical perspective by uh, analyzing the global money market uh, at the height of the first globalization, uh, so in the early 20th century, right? Um, at that time, the pound sterling was the global currency. London uh, was the world's international financial center. And the London market for sterling bills of exchange in particular um, was the main platform for international short-term lending and borrowing. So it was really the global money market. So our aim in this project is to use uh, the tools of network analysis uh, in order to analyze the functioning of the global money market before the First World War. Uh, and we have two main questions in main. Uh, the first question is, how was the pre-World War I global money market organized? How was it structured? How did it work? And then the second question is, uh, how resilient was this market to financial shocks, right? So these are the questions I'm gonna focus on today uh, in the presentation. Uh, so what I will do is first give you a little bit of background on uh, bills of exchange and how they worked. Then I will uh, briefly talk about our data and sources. Uh, in a third part, I will present a set of descriptive findings on the organization of the London money market uh, in that period. And finally, I will present the more preliminary um, results we have produced on the resilience of this market to financial shocks. Um, but let me start first by uh, clarifying uh, how the money market worked uh, by then, right? So as I said before, the main instrument used for money market transactions at that time was the sterling bill of exchange. So what was a sterling bill of exchange? Well, it was an instrument of private short-term credit, which was used by firms and merchants uh, all over the world in order to finance their activities. And when we talk about bills of exchange, what is really important to keep in mind is that it was a very flexible instrument which could be used in a variety of ways. Its main use was for trade finance. However, it could finance other types of activities, especially financial uh, operations, such as uh, security investment, currency speculation, and, and, and et cetera. Um, so it was a very flexible instrument. At the same time, however, uh, there was one common thing to all bills which is uh, that uh, they always involved at least three agents. First of all, the drawer of the bill, so the person who addressed the bill and who was the money market borrower. Second, each bill had a so-called acceptor. The acceptor was uh, the agent who guaranteed the payment of the bill at maturity and therefore was a debt guarantor. And finally, each bill had a discounter. The discounter was the agent who purchased the bill and was therefore the ultimate lender, right? Uh, so you can see an example here. It is a bill which was uh, drawn uh, by a firm in Moscow in August 1910 on London. So a sterling bill, as you see, it's denominated in sterling. Uh, and you could always identify the three agents from each bill, the name of the drawer, appeared always on the bottom right, the name of the acceptor, again, the, the debt guarantor, appeared on the uh, bottom left. And finally, the names of all successive discounters of bills uh, appeared on the back of the bills, right? 
So uh, what we are uh, interested in here uh, is uh, to understand who these drawers, acceptors, and discounters actually were on the London money market before the First World War. And then um, also we uh, want to know who was connected to whom through these bills of exchange, right? So in order to document that, um, the main source we use in this project is um, uh, an archival uh, source, which is the Bank of England's discount ledgers. The Bank of England indeed was a big player in the London mill market. It purchased a large number of bills as part of its monetary policy operations. And also the bank reported systematic information on all bills which it purchased. And in particular, it reported the name of the drawer, so the borrower and their location, but also the name of the two London intermediaries uh, involved in the in the bill, the acceptor, so again the debt guarantor, and the discounter, the ultimate lender. Right? So what we did here is to collect that information for all individual bills which were purchased by the Bank of England in the year 1906. We choose the year 1906 uh, for reasons I can explain later on. Uh, so there are more than 23,000 bills uh, from 1906. And we uh, use this data to reconstruct the network of agents which were involved in the origination of these bills, right? So especially we re re record all links between agents who appear on the same bills, right? So we look at relationships between drawers and acceptors, relationships between acceptors and discounters. And finally, we also look at the more indirect relationship that existed between a drawer and a discounter, right? And that's how we build our uh, network, right? Um, so now a fair thing we can document with these data is where the borrowers on the London money market were located. Um, so this map shows here uh, the geographical distribution of money market borrowers in 1906. So the drawers of bills, right? And as we see clearly on the map, uh, borrowers through sterling bills originated from across the whole world. There was very wide geographical uh, dispersion, uh, which clearly shows that the London money market was a global money market at that time, right? So you already had firms and merchants from everywhere in the world who, who, who borrowed on that market, right? Uh, and of course, this wide geographical dispersion arises the question of how these borrowers were being screened, right? Um, indeed, the average investor in London typically had very little information about foreign borrowers. So there must have been substantial informational asymmetries between lenders and borrowers on that market. And what we argue in our paper um, is that money market intermediaries played a key role in solving these informational asymmetries so as to allow lending to take place. Uh, and the main role here was played by the acceptors of bills. Uh, so as I said before, the acceptors were the guarantors of bills of exchange. They guaranteed the payment of the bills for their domestic and foreign clients in exchange for a fee, right? And when consulting the archives of the main acceptors in the London city, where the, the London merchant banks, we realized that these agents um, specialized in gathering detailed information about money market borrowers abroad. Um, so there was a special relationship that they uh, developed with firms abroad who wanted to borrow on the London uh, money market. And we can see that uh, in our data uh, as well. And in particular, what we observe in our data is that uh, drawers of bills, so borrowers again, on average had much fewer acceptors than discounters, which suggests that there was um, a special relationship between drawers and acceptors because the latter held private information on the former, right? 
Um, so to show this, we look at the distribution of, uh, of drawers of bills and we classify them according to whether they had more discounters than acceptance or fewer discounters than acceptance. Uh, and then we compare this distribution to, the, to two sets of simulated networks in which links between agents are formed uh, purely randomly, right? Uh, and what we see uh, in the table is that um, there was about 50% of the drawers in our data uh, who had more discounters than acceptors. By contrast, if links between agents had been formed purely randomly, as in our simulations, uh, less than 5% of the drawers would have had more discounters than acceptors, given the demography of our uh, network, right? So what this suggests here is that there was uh, clearly something special about the relationship between drawers and acceptors. And, um, and this um, uh, pattern is typical of relationship lending markets, where um, uh, banks hold private information about their customers, right? So acceptors played an important role, but then, um, of course, uh, then their role was also complemented by that of the discounters. Indeed, a legal role on the London bill market was that every discounter of a bill of exchange uh, was adding a secondary guarantee to the bill, in addition to that of the first guarantor, the acceptor, right? Um, so, uh, in our data, actually, we identified two types of discounters. First of all, there were so-called discount houses, uh, which were institutions which worked a little bit like money market funds nowadays. They took short-term money from clients in order to invest on, in money market instruments, and they obtained their bills mostly directly from the UK acceptors. So here, their role was to screen the acceptors of the bills. And then on the other hand, you had the multinational banks, uh, also called Anglo foreign banks, uh, which mostly obtained their bills from their foreign correspondents or the branches in the countries where they uh, were uh, specializing. And, and we can see this. Yes, perfect. So we can see this distinction here. Uh, between the two types of institutions. So here you have the discount houses, again, which very much look like money market funds nowadays. Uh, and here you have uh, three um, multinational banks. And what we see uh, clearly that uh, whereas the, uh, the discount houses, portfolios of bills were uh, uh, geographically diversified, uh, what we see that the multinational banks portfolios of bills were highly skewed towards the regions where they specialize. So, you know, North America for the Canadian Bank of Commerce, Latin America for uh, the Bank of Tarapaca and Argentina, for example. So in that case, it, it looks like the borrowers had been screened locally by the multinational banks, foreign branch or foreign correspondent, right? Um, so, you know, overall, um, uh, what we see that uh, the organization of the money market was quite complex, right? With all these different types of actors doing different types of activities. And there were many ways through which the bills were screened and could eventually find their way on the money market. Uh, however, what we see as well is that intermediaries in London appeared to have played a crucial role in solving informational asymmetries and allowing uh, lending to be sustained and uh, allowing for the robustness of the of the market. Right. So now that we have described the organization of the London money market, um, the next question we want to address is uh, how resilient was this network to financial shocks? And in order to address this question, we perform network simulations again um, to measure the effects of an intermediary's failure on the whole money market network, right? Uh, so concretely, we measure the impact of removing individual intermediaries on the whole network. And we look at how many agents lose market access when one intermediary is removed, right? And the preliminary results we have obtained so far is that uh, the, the network appears to exhibit stronger resilience 
than uh, modern interbank networks where typically you have a few uh, institutions at the core who are highly uh, systemic. Uh, on this graph, for each intermediary, you have, uh, sorry, its total impact rate, uh, which is uh, uh, um, uh, defined as the share of agents who lose market access if that intermediary is removed from the network. And what we see is that there are very few intermediaries who are highly systemic. There are only two institutions here, one discount house and one multinational bank uh, whose failure would have resulted in a loss of market access for more than 4% of, um, of agents in the, in the money market, right? Thank you. Uh, go to your conclusions. Yes, yes. So I'll go to my conclusions. Um, I'll skip that. Um, so, you know, uh, basically to summarize, um, what, as I said before, what we're trying to do here is analyze the structure of the global sterling uh, money market before the First World War. Uh, what we find is that there was a great variety of borrowers and also a great variety of ways through which the bills could be originated and distributed. But intermediaries played a crucial role in resolving informational asymmetries. Um, the money market network uh, that we observe appears to have been more resilient than uh, modern interbank uh, networks, and there may be some policy lessons here. And indeed, uh, the liquidity of the London money market was only questioned once in our period, uh, which is when you had one big exogenous shock, which was the outbreak of World War I, which really put uh, into question uh, the solvency of many uh, intermediaries, right? Uh, but uh, but you know the, we believe that the structure of this market probably explains uh, its robustness during the first globalization. So I'll end it here because I'm um, out of time and I'm looking forward to your questions. Great. So we do have time for um, a few questions uh, for Olivier. If you can post them in the Q and A uh, button, I'll read them out. Um, in the meantime, can I just ask whether, reflecting on your uh, data sample for the first part of your analysis, the 1906 um, Bank of England uh, discount uh, ledger, whether there might be a bias or a selection problem uh, because they might maybe have higher quality acceptors uh, than the general market? Yes, of course. Um, it's a very important question. We, we, so we try to address that. They, um, you know, I mean, there could be all sorts, there could be two, two types of biases, right? It could be that um, you had, uh, they, they were more uh, cautious than other discounters on the market, and therefore uh, they had higher quality uh, bills. But it could be the opposite as well, right? Given that they had a discount window, it could be that the, the, the money market um, uh, participants try to unload their worst quality bills to the Bank of England. Uh, because they could, right? So, you know, what we did is to compare the, the, the build portfolio of the Bank of England with uh, the portfolio of one major discount house, which is Gillette Brothers. Uh, we do identify some biases, especially what we see that um, the, the Bank of England had a bias against foreign banks. Uh, the foreign branches of, uh, the, the branches of foreign banks. Um, but we don't find you know, a, a huge biases uh, either. And we don't find, especially we don't find huge quality biases in particular, right? So the, main, the main bias we find is this discrimination against foreign banks, which, you, which uh, appears to have been strong at the Bank of England. Yeah. Okay, and just one quick follow-up. Uh, Mene Savaro is asking, uh, why 1906? Is that just serendipity or is there, I know that there's a crisis on the way. Um, uh, but uh, why 1906? Yeah, so um, the thing is, you know, we, we, you know, if we had more money, we would have uh, just uh, uh, collected uh, data for all years, but that's very tedious. Uh, so we chose 1906 because, you know, you need to have a year where there is sub substantial activity at the, at the Bank of England's discount window because you need to have many, as many bills as possible, right? At the same time, we wanted to avoid years where you had a full-blown financial crisis because of possible selection biases, right? So eventually we choose 1906 because you have a lot of money market activity of the Bank of England in that year. 
At the same time, there is no full-blown um, financial crisis in the city. So, you know, we, we thought it was, a, it was a good year to, to choose, right? You know, the next step in the project may be uh, if we get funding to extend that to, to, to more uh, cross-sections. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for a fascinating paper, um, Olivier. Um, and we'll move on now to Mark Carlson from the Federal Reserve Board. Mark, are you there? I am here. Great, okay, so we're moving into the interwar period um, and Mark will be looking about at uh, cross-border capital flows and the Great Depression for the US. All right, uh, so thank you uh, so much for inviting me to participate. Uh, this is a, a fantastic conference uh, and I'm delighted to, to talk about this paper, um, Domestic and International Crises in the Early 1930s and Conditions in the U.S. money and treasury bond market, this is uh, this is very preliminary. I'm looking forward to uh, all all comments and suggestions. Uh, the standard disclaimer applies. These are these are my views and should not be interpreted as reflecting the views of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve or its staff. Okay, so let me start by sort of framing the motivation for this paper, and then give you a little bit of a sense of where I'm going to be going. So there is a, uh, some debate in the literature about the extent to which developments abroad, especially in Europe, uh, affected financial and economic conditions in the United States in the early 1930s. Uh, to oversimplify a, a fairly large literature, uh, one path for the international transmission uh, as described by Eichen, Green, Temin and others is through the gold standard. Uh, in this case, crises in Europe, uh, first in Germany uh, and then in the United Kingdom, uh, gave rise to concerns that the about the U.S. commitment to gold. So the Fed then tightens policy in response to the resulting outflows uh, of in flight from the dollar. Uh, and the tighter monetary policy then uh, causes problems in the in the U.S. Some further evidence that there was transmission uh, from Europe to the U.S. is from uh, um, Rickstall and, and Sabarez, uh, who find that financial distress, especially in the banking sector. Uh, in Germany if, did affect the, the US. However, uh, papers that have looked at sort of in, very, in a very detailed way at the institutions who are most likely to be affected by uh, financial shocks originating abroad, uh, which would be the New York City banks, which had the largest foreign exposures, uh, find that there's no real impact on, on these banks or their behavior from uh, developments in Europe. And so that casts uh, some doubt about it, whether there's any sort of direct direct connections. Uh, in looking at all of this stuff, there's also good reason to think that there may have been, uh, you know, what was going on in the US was very highly domestically focused. There was a number of banking panics in the US, uh, especially in 1931. And so any sort of analysis of what's going on has to take careful account for what's uh, going on in the, in the US itself. And so what I'm gonna try to do in this paper is look at uh, this well-traveled question yet again, uh, but I'm going to use uh, a different, some new, some new data, uh, some fairly high frequency, which in my case is weekly data, to examine whether uh, conditions in U.S. money and treasury markets were affected by international financial shocks. And so, in the course of the presentation, I'm going to talk through some of the description of the exposures to New York City uh, from foreign and domestic factors. I'm going to present some statistical analysis. What I'm going to try to look at: what is the role of international factors? What what is the role of domestic factors and also try to account for what's going on with monetary policy and look at how these things are affecting uh, conditions in these two financial markets. Now, what I'm gonna find is that uh, international developments did indeed, uh, or at least suggestive evidence that, that foreign developments left an imprint on, on US markets. So let's start by uh, talking about the presence of uh, foreign investors in New York City and the exposure to international factors. So during the interwar period, uh, New York City becomes an increasingly important financial center. Uh, the, this, this table presents uh, the holdings of short-term liabilities uh, by investors from Europe uh, in, in US or in either in US banks or uh, in US short-term uh, instruments uh, that were sort of in custody accounts at, at New York banks, uh, including the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And you can see that uh, from in the, on the left, 
is the holdings of short-term liabilities by the foreign investors. And uh, the remaining columns here, I'm trying to give you a sense of the size of the different uh, money market assets uh, in, the, in the system. Uh, and as the total is on the, on the far right of the table. And you can see that holdings of short-term liabilities by foreign investors sort of through, the, through these international connections uh, we're, we're a fairly sizable, represented a sizable portion of the funds invested uh, in US money markets. Uh, let me say just briefly a few words about the acceptance market. Uh, these, this market had grown rapidly in the 1920s. Uh, a significant portion of this market was linked to foreign trade or activities uh, abroad. And when I started this project, I thought this market was going to be a very key part of the story. And it, it may be part of the story, but uh, at least as far as I can tell, it was not, uh, it was not key. Um, I haven't quite figured that part out completely yet. Um, and so I, I felt it was, I needed to mention it, uh, but I'm not gonna discuss it uh, any further in the talk today. All right, uh, turning to domestic factors. So the banks in New York City had long been central to the US money and financial markets. Uh, banks across the US had held balances in New York City for, for decades. This, these were useful in, in clearing payments and meeting reserve requirements, uh, investing in securities markets. Uh, they were, were funds that reflected their ability to borrow uh, short-term funds. With the introduction of the Federal Reserve, uh, the importance of these, of these balances diminished, but, uh, but they certainly were retained by a number of banks across the US. And so during the banking panics, some of these deposits would have been uh, you know, withdrawn by the banks that needed the funds uh, back at their home office. And so during there was a uh, fair bit of deposit flight uh, during the panics that would then have strained New York City banks. And those withdrawals of funds from the New York City banks could then have been passed on to the, to the money and treasury markets. So those outs, sort of outline the, the mechanisms that, we're gonna, that I'm gonna try to look at when thinking about what is driving uh, conditions in the, in the money and treasury market. So in order to, to do this, to the, um, the formal analysis, I need measures of conditions, both in the money market and the treasury market. So for the money market, I'm gonna consider the spread between 90 day commercial paper, uh, the rate on that, on that paper and the federal funds rate. So commercial paper was were short-term loans to high quality, medium-sized businesses. The commercial rate is the rate at which banks or other financial institutions uh, would buy this money market instrument. And the 90 day rate is, it was a fairly common uh, maturity for this paper. So that's what I'm gonna look at. Uh, the federal funds rate uh, is the rate at which banks, mainly in New York city would be borrowing from or lending to each other, typically overnight. Uh, this is, uh, uh, recent, very recently collected data um, by myself, as well as uh, Dave Wheelock, Chris Haynes, and uh, Sri Amel. Uh, and it's going to be very helpful to try to measure, to, th to think about the conditions, right? So now we have a 90-day rate versus an overnight rate. So you can think about, you know, the conditions in money market being related to a term spread. Uh, you can, this, this spread could also reflect the interme intermediation spread. So banks are lending to the commercial paper and they're able to obtain funds at the federal funds rate. Uh, it could also reflect um, a credit, credit risk to the extent that uh, these commercial paper borrowers are, are more risky than, um, than, the commercial, than the commercial banks that would be borrowing federal funds. Uh, but I'm gonna hope that that doesn't change uh, too rapidly over the course of a, over the course of a week, say, um, and that these, these first two parts are the, are the driving factors. So to measure uh, what's going on in conditions in the treasury market, I'm going to look at the bid asked, the spread between the bid price and the ask price for treasury bonds. Uh, treasury bonds are the most liquid part of the longer term market uh, at this point. Um, the treasury securities were an important secondary reserve. So we would also expect to see stresses uh, materialize here. Uh, this spread is gonna be a much cleaner measure of um, market functioning. And so I think looking at, so that looking at this is going to be a nice complement to what's look, looking at, uh, at money markets. For both of these, I have 
I'm able to compute daily daily spreads, and I'm going to average those uh, over the over a week to align with the other data that I have. All right, so those are two important building blocks. Uh, the next building blocks I'm going to need to are the indicators of stress. So for uh, for the indicators of international stress, given that the, the source of the stress is going to be pressures on, on the dollar and the like and concerns about whether the U.S. would abandon the gold standard, uh, I'm going to look at, uh, compare this the spot rate uh, to the forward rate uh, of the dollar relative to another currency. I'm going to pick the country with arguably the strongest commitment to gold, which is, which is France. And I'm going to, so concerns about a devaluation should lead the spot rate and the forward rate to deviate sharply. And I'm going to use the same measure that's uh, used by, this is the same measure that's used by uh, Say and Romer in their study of this period. So uh, domestic, domestic stress is going to be indicated by weekly closures of non-New York City banks. Uh, Chris Michener and Gary Richardson have some, uh, have some papers look, who look at what happens uh, when there were bank closures and they find that this was, these closures were associated with withdrawals of funds from New York. And that could be because of funds drawn down by those banks that were closing, but also because of um, nearby banks who then felt the need to gather liquid resources locally in order to meet uh, potential runs. On. And um, Gary and Chris have kindly uh, shared the data uh, with me. Four minutes. Um, Perfect. So find the final building block uh, is the Federal Reserve. So I'm going to look at actions uh, by the Fed to change monetary policy. Uh, so both of this could be the interest rate at which banks could borrow from the Fed, the which is the referred to as the discount rate. And there's also the change in the rate at which the Fed would purchase acceptances. Uh, the other thing I'm going to account for is bank borrowing from the Federal Reserve. So this is one way that uh, banks might prevent stresses from, uh, from affecting money uh, and uh, treasury markets. So in the analysis, I'm gonna use a, a vector autoregression and this is gonna allow you know, each of these, these building blocks to influence each other one, um, which is just with a leg. And I'm, I'm going to use a specification with two legs of each of the variables. Uh, I have weekly data from January, 1929 until December, 1932. And so these uh, are the, uh, the res impulse response functions from the vector autoregression. Uh, and so in the, in the upper slide of panels, I apologize that they're a little fuzzy, but you can see what's the, the, the one to the far left is the response of money market spreads to, the, uh, to a shock to monetary policy. And so you can see when the Fed tightens monetary policy that that uh, tightens conditions in uh, this widens out the spread between the commercial paper rate and the federal and the um, and the federal funds rate. You also see from the middle panel that there was a, a tightening of or the widening of this money market spread in response to concerns about expected uh, devaluation, uh, which is consistent with this idea that international uh, shocks were transmitted to to U.S. money markets. Uh, in the final upper right. Uh, chart, you see that there's not really any response uh, to bank closures, uh, which is uh, was surprising to me. And I'm still trying to understand why uh, that would be, because you would very strongly expect that there would be an impact, uh, impact here. Uh, if you look at the bottom row of charts, you see that uh, this is the same, but this is just for the treasury market. And so you can see in the bottom left, uh, the bo bid ask spreads in the treasury market do not respond to changes. Uh, in in the in the in the discount rate, uh, this may be it, it may well be the case that the level of of bond spread of bond prices moves, but just uh, the bid ask spread did not widen. Um, the middle chart, you see, in the middle lower, you see that there was a response in uh, in bond spreads to expected depreciation, uh, so that suggests a deterioration in the condition of bond of the US bond market functioning in response to concerns about devaluation. And then finally, you also don't see a uh, response of the treasury market uh, to developments in, um, in, in bank failures. All right, so this, this is suggestive evidence that there was a transmission um, from international shocks to uh, depreciation. And then I would like to briefly talk about some evidence on a mechanism by which this um, 
this occurred. So one channel in particular might be because uh, what I'm gonna look at is whether there was an impact on the balance sheets of some of the New York banks. I'm in particular gonna look at whether there was a change in their lending on uh, securities collateral, which was the main uh, vehicle by which they provided funds to the US money markets. So I'm gonna look at the stresses on their lending, and then I'm gonna look at the, whether the lending then affects money market spreads. And I find tentative evidence that these linkages mattered. And so that's shown here. So the first uh, column one shows the responses in lending to on securities to the various shocks. You can see in lines three and four that there's not so much of a response uh, to bank, suspen uh, bank suspensions, but there is as shown by lines five and six that when there was increasing concerns about devaluation that there was less lending on securities by New York banks. And you see in column two, this, this second step uh, in this mechanism uh, where whereby if there was a change in lending by securities that had an impact on uh, this, this money market spread that I'm measuring. And so if you just walk through these different parts, you see that an increase in concerns is gonna reduce lending. Reduce lending is gonna to lead to a, wider, to a wider spread. Maybe you move to your conclusions, Mark. And there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to summarize, we find evidence. So this paper is sort of look, is taking another look at uh, international bank connections. Uh, their impact on conditions in New York financial markets. So I find pretty clear evidence of an indirect effect sort of through monetary policy, the Fed tightened in response to expected to, uh, to pre concerns about the dollar that seems to be transmitted through to financial markets. I also find some evidence of conditions affected uh, develop, uh, conditions in money markets through uh, bank balance sheets and their willingness to, to lend into these, into these markets. So thank you. That was what I uh, had to say. Great, thanks very much. Uh, Mark, a really interesting paper and a quite well-trodden question. So uh, you're finding new evidence for the sort of transmission route uh, for, for those cross-border flows. Um, just maybe while I'm waiting for questions to come up in the Q&A um, uh, box, your original data showing the relative um, size of foreign and the domestic money markets. Um, it was, it was as of December 1929, and I wonder why you had chosen that date, which is, of course, after uh, the September or the October. So I've, um, so, so, so actually, uh, so the, so you see, it's interesting that you see foreign ex exposures are still increase, increasing through this time, and it's really not till. Uh, some of the more the, the European crises that emerge in the in the 30s that you see that the that foreign investment in the U.S. Uh, diminishes. So I was actually kind of surprised that you don't really see a decline in foreign investment following this rather you know following this sharp shock to the U.S. stock market. And I would have was quite expecting that there would be a decline, but you don't see it. Um, it doesn't. If, if I were to use like 1928 or 1927, um, you, you actually get a fairly similar picture in terms of the relative size of foreign investment uh, compared to the size of these different money markets. And so since I wanted to talk mostly about the, this sort of 1931 event, having something closer to that point seemed, seemed helpful. Excellent, thanks very much. Um, so questions for Mark. Um, I wondered if you, wanted to uh, pull yourself a little bit forward. Are there implications in this for how we understand the impact of cross-border flows on uh, sort of the transmission through securities markets, as well as the kind of traditional route um, that you wanted to highlight? So I, I, I guess the, the so the one thought I have is, is you know, sort of each time I go digging to try to understand um, sort of foreign, uh, the, level, the level of money market, uh, money market borrowing or money market lending that occurs internationally, uh, it's always larger uh, than I think. Um, and I think I see, you see that here where this is a really large share of um, uh, 
the, the, the size of the foreign investments in the U.S. is actually a fairly large share of uh, the outstanding amounts of, of U.S. money market securities. William Allen is wondering, do you know how much of that is from foreign central banks rather than banks? I think a, a significant portion of it is foreign central banks. Um, so parsing that out would be a, would be would be a little hard. I see you do see sort of foreign central banks uh, will have placed deposits at the at the Federal Reserve, and so I can you can separate that out. Um, it may still be the case that those foreign central banks also place money with private U.S. banks uh, for. Um, for for some reason, but you can get a little bit uh, of a sense of that. Um, I think there's a table in the paper that would let you take a look at that, but I can't remember exactly what the numbers are offhand. Okay, um, thanks very much, Mark. Um, uh, and I think we'll move uh, swiftly on to our final paper uh, for this session, uh, which is Natasha postel and Stephanie Collette. Uh, Natasha is from the London School of Economics, and uh, Stephanie has now moved to the Deutsche Bundesbank. So again, we're, we're still in the uh, interwar period, but it's slightly earlier and looking at the accumulation of fragilities in the uh, German uh, banking system. Uh, so thanks very much for inviting us at this conference. Uh, so as we just said, this is joint work with Stephanie Collet, uh, and she's with us today. And so she'll be able to participate in the discussion, which is really nice. Um, we're really glad to have an opportunity to present our work for the first time. <laughs> so the work is really quite preliminary. I just want to emphasize this. Okay. Um, yeah. so, so the question that we ask is, do hot capital inflows uh, cause bank risk taking? And this is an interesting question, we think, uh, because we live in an uh, increasingly interconnected financial world. Um, but also, uh, there's been lots of crises in Latin America, in East Asia, in the Eurozone, uh, that seem to have been very often preceded by sudden capital inflows. Um, unfortunately, in our view, in some ways, a lot of debates about the causes of these crises uh, have often set sort of the international factors on the one hand against more uh, domestic factors. And this is in some ways not so true of third generation models that have really tried to look at the interactions between international factors and domestic factors. Um, but a problem with a lot of these third generation models is that they really focus on the dynamics of the crisis um, and the focus on sort of really what happens when the crisis occurs uh, and the combination of, you know, banking crisis and currency crisis, but they don't really look at sort of what happens before the crisis and whether there may be international factors that sort of expand uh, risk taking and bank risk taking in particular in the years preceding the crisis. Um, there have been papers looking at those interactions, such as by Diaz Alejandro, uh, but there's actually been little empirical evidence on the question. Uh, so the question we ask here is, can we learn anything from 1920s Germany? Uh, I'm pretty sure that I won't surprise you uh, by saying that Germany is a pretty contentious case in the interwar period, uh, with on the one hand, many authors saying that uh, the causes of the crisis are not really a problem with the domestic banks. They're more to do with uh, foreign investors and fiscal issues and foreign investors suddenly withdrawing their funds. Um, and there's others who've been emphasizing the fact that uh, lots of domestic banks took a lot of risks. Um, and so emphasizing both sort of the banking crisis aspect as well as the currency crisis. Um, but in some ways, this literature hasn't really uh, systematically looked at the impact of foreign inflows on bank risk taking before the crisis. Um, and so that's what we're really interested in. It, there's been some implications in the literature that there may have been impacts of foreign inflows on bank risk taking, for example, uh, in Richel's work. Uh, but we want to sort of have a more, um, a quicker look, a, 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 a deeper look at, at, at what's going on in the banks. Now, a problem with this is that we face two empirical issues. If we want to look at the uh, relationship between uh, inflows and bank risk taking, first of all, there's going to be an endogeneity issue because 
Yes, it's true, inflows may affect risk-taking, but on the other hand, bank behavior can also affect inflows, right? A more aggressive uh, bank uh, risk profile, for example, will seek to attract more inflows. So that's the first problem we need to deal with. A second problem we've got in our data is that Data on foreign liabilities is actually quite patchy. So the 1920s deposit data that we have does not explicitly separate the two, the foreign from the domestic deposits. On the other hand, though, we do have data on 1930 foreign liabilities. And so we can probably find solutions about this, and I'm going to talk about them now. So what's our approach? Our approach is a combined panel and instrumental variable approach in three steps. So first, we explore the relationship between 1930 foreign liabilities and deposit growth in the 1920s. And from this, we extract the relevant deposit types, right? And then in a second step, we run our panel analysis by regressing seeing the risk change on relevant deposit change over time. And of course, we need to mitigate endogeneity. And the way that we do this is that we include only the months in which the US German interest rate spread falls. And that's similar to what Dinga and Takat do. Now, in the third step for robustness, what we do is we conduct an instrumental variable approach in the pre-crisis cross-section, which I'm going to uh, detail a bit further down below. But um, our instrument is going to be initial bank size, and we're going to try and justify this in a moment. We also think that a main contribution of our paper is that we've got a new data set. So we hand collect in data on the evolution of banks balance sheets from 1925 to 1938 in Germany. The focus is on 1925-1930. We've got about 130 banks, so that's 9,000 observations. The data is from the DRPS. And we uh, make use also of data very kindly shared by Stefan Luck and his co-authors on 1930 foreign liabilities. Um, so this is the data from DRPS. Now, what do we find? Um, we find that foreign inflows are a strong predictor of leverage, loan growth, and bad loans. Um, not such a strong predictor of changes in liquidity. The issue does not seem to concern only the big Berlin banks, so that overall capital inflows are not just a mismatch and withdrawal risk, uh, but also uh, seem to have induced bank risk taking. Okay, so now just to give you a little bit of context on the post doors plan debt boom, what the literature says. First of all, it does look from reading the literature that bank risk taking did seem to expand in the 1920s. Right, so after the 1923 hyperinflation, banks underwent a dramatic expansion. And this expansion went hand in hand with risk taking. Of course, we don't know whether this is causal or not, but at least we know this happened. We know that liquidity uh, f fell. We know that capital ratios fell dramatically as well. Um, so that there were significant issue. We also know that there was a lack of asset diversification at the banks. There was overlending to municipalities um, and there was lack of asset diversification more generally. Uh, lots of banks were lending to single borrowers that they knew uh, and they had known for a long time so that there was overinvestment uh, in specific types of industry. Now, if we ask about the causes of bank risk taking, clearly, um, it looks like the structure of the German economy may have played a role. So it looks like banks were uh, over-investing perhaps in sunset industries or maybe in the rationalized industries. There's a little bit of a debate about this. Um, strong competition and lack of banking regulation seems to have played a role as well. And even though Rice Bank policy was overall quite restrictive, at times it was looser. And so that may have played a role as well. Now, what about um, bank risk taking and foreign inflows? This hypothesis has never really been systematically explored. It's implicit though in quite a few accounts. Um, and there has been quite an increase in loanable funds at the time in foreign loanable funds, actually deposits, foreign deposits increased by a factor of 7.4. The interesting thing theoretically is that a, a sudden foreign inflow can act like a sudden domestic increase in loanable funds, right? Um, so that pushes banks to take more risks. Now, it's true that there were some demand factors, right? Demand factors may or almost certainly play a role in the foreign inflows. And these are the ones that we're not really interested in, right? Um, so there was strong demand for funds following hyperinflation because there was a huge capital shortage. And monetary policy may have also spurred demand, although I won't go into the details here. And tax avoidance probably played a role as well, as has been documented by Harold James. 
Now, what about supply factors? These are the ones that we're interested in. Supply factors seem to have dominated long-term gross lending. So that's long-term lending. It's not really what we're interested in, but that's you know an interesting piece of information in itself. That's in the work by uh, Olivier and, and Barry Eichengreen. Um, we also think that's very much uh, uh, talked about in the literature. The DOS plan seems to have uh, really contributing to boosting supply. And as a result, and this is something you really see in the data, interest rates really fell from the 1925 peak. How did banks use these foreign inflows? Well, some of the inflows seem to have been directly linked to foreign trade. Um, so, and that was the case at least initially. So very often these were you know, linked to the lines of credit uh, on foreign banks that we've been talking about, the trade acceptances. On the liability side, these appeared as liabilities for clients and they were secured by trade goods deemed to be self-liquidating. A problem with this is that over time, these liabilities for clients were increasingly made for other loans, for often uncovered and non-trade loans. And this is thoroughly documented by Balderstone. And eventually, actually, a lot of the foreign lending was done through simple deposits, and these were unconnected to trade, and they were usually three months maturity and in foreign currency. So this is data that shows you the difference between these liabilities for clients uh, linked to trade acceptances and the foreign owned deposits. Okay, so what's our empirical approach? So I've already mentioned the two challenges. Um, and I've mentioned our solution in three steps to extract the most relevant deposit types, the panel analysis, and the instrumental variable approach in the cross section. So let's try and extract these relevant deposit types. So the nice thing about the 1930 data on foreign liabilities, which is about the banks that uh, had the highest shares of foreign uh, liabilities or foreign debt. Uh, in the German banking system that were required to report to the Rice Bank. Um, there were about uh, 22 banks within this sample. Um, and we can see that these banks really expanded. So they're called here, they're, they're, they're miscalled foreign banks. They're not forereign banks, but they're the sort of foreign inflow banks. Um, and these saw the largest increase in um, trade deposits. So these, these liabilities for clients here that I was just talking about relative to the other banks. And these banks also saw a huge increase in uh, three month deposits here relative to the other types of banks. And this is not true for the other two types of deposits. So not true for seven day deposits, but there's not much increase at all. These are indices um, and not true for due to banks either. So that means we can focus on these trade deposits and three month deposits. Uh, incidentally, if we have a look at these uh, uh, nice graphs of just trying to differentiate between these two types of banks, we can see that quite clearly these banks had a capital to total asset ratio that was falling quite dramatically over time between 1925 and 1930. Um, they also made more uncovered trade loans. Um, they participated more in the stock market um, and they had more uh, short, um, short term loans. Now, what do we do in the panel analysis? So we focus, we look at the months in which the spreads in interest rates uh, between uh, Germany and the US fell. So these are our three periods here where these spreads fell. The two most important lines here, are this one and this one, the other two are just uh, sort of the rice bank discount rate, which we can see by the way, fell a lot less than the spreads in these other rates. Um, so we use these periods and what we end up having is a nice, uh, panel regression of liability growth um, on, uh, sorry, of of, um, of of changes in total capital to total assets and loans uh, to total assets on liability growth um, in the short term, two months, in the long term, uh, six months with some controls. And we can see nicely that liability growth, as we expected, does decrease the uh, capital to total asset ratio, um, but also actually increases uh, loans to total assets at these banks. Uh, if we look at these plots, we've been trying to uh, explore a little bit the relationship for different types of banks, so the Great Berlin banks, other banks, the credit banks, the Staatslands banks, the Jurats and Tell. And I wish I had the time to go through all of this. Um, but, uh, but what we can see is that the relationship is strongest at the credit banks and not so much at the Jurats uh, and Tell and Staatslands and Landbanken. Uh, 
Now, what do we do in our third step as a robustness? We look at the pre-crisis cross-section at February 1929. And what we do is we regress risk-taking, so capital to total assets, say, on foreign debt uh, as a binary variable. Uh, as I said, there's a little bit of a caveat here, which is it's only 22 banks in this category, right? But we know these banks really had the highest share of foreign debt in the country. Um, and we use initial bank size as our instrument. Now, why this instrument? Well, bank size can be a little bit controversial, but at least in terms of relevance, it's definitely not controversial because we all know that larger banks attract more inflows. Now, in terms of validity, this is why it's controversial is because nowadays you would always say that larger banks, you know, take more risks. Why? Because they are too big to fail, right? So the too big to fail means all sorts of things which entail uh, in the end further risk taking. So all of this hinges on whether there was a too big to fail environment in the 1920s already. Now Schnabel has argued for the presence of liquidity guarantee uh, and that was linked to the credit stop in 1924, which I won't go into, uh, unfortunately I don't have time. Um, uh, so uh, Natasha, we're down to the last minute or so, so if sure. you wanted to leap to yeah, yeah, yes. Sure. But of her own admission, uh, this is slightly speculative. And in fact, I will argue that, um, and, and, and we will argue actually that uh, this was the gold standard era. And so the banks, as everybody knew, uh, the Rice Bank had a very significant conflict of goals, uh, which meant that uh, the, the highest bank basically could not at the same time save the banks and save the currency at the same time. And surely the banks were all aware of this. And so this implicit liquidity guarantee hinged on the severity of any future currency crisis. In addition, there is no concrete evidence at all of an implicit bailout guarantee, which Nabil totally admits. Uh, so that means that perhaps the idea of a too big to fail environment is slightly anachronistic. That's my own timer. <laughs> These are results from uh, the IV analysis, and we can see that the first stage is definitely all right. Um, and we can see uh, indeed that being a foreign uh, inflow bank uh, significantly reduces your capital to total asset ratio. It reduces your liquidity ratio, but by less, right? So the most of the action is in capital to total uh, assets. Conclusions, our results suggest that foreign inflows are a strong predictor of leverage, loan growth, bad loans. The results are less strong for changes in liquidity, but overall we can say, I think with quite certainty, that capital inflows are not just a withdrawal and currency mismatch risk, but induced bank risk taking in the period before the crisis. Now, just to caveat, the results are very preliminary. We need to deal with mergers, takeovers, bank types. We need to explore dynamics further, add more controls, add other variables. We need to explore different spreads in different countries. And we need to explore a crisis and post-crisis dynamics since we've got data up to 1938. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Natasha, for a really rich, uh, rich <laughs> paper indeed. Uh, thank you for rattling through so quickly. Um, I have a question from Linda Goldberg. Um, who wonders, while inflows might have led to increased risk taking, as you say, could this be interpreted as a positive development given the initial lack of diversification and the set of positions in set sunset industries? Uh, let's so how you're defining if risk taking. Wants to, to, to answer this, is she here? Is Stephanie here? Um, maybe she's not. Um, okay. Stephanie, it's, about, it's about how you're defining risk taking um, and maybe yeah, it's a good just question. diversifying. It's a good question. Um, I mean, you could see, so uh, to some extent, for sure, banks were short of capital. Um, and so they needed to expand, right? So expansion is not necessarily a sign of risk taking at all. If it was just expansion, it would be fine. Um, but I guess what we see is really a difference between the two types of banks, right? So all types of banks expanded massively, right? But there were just some banks that in this expansion phase were a little bit more careful and didn't decrease their uh, capital ratio as much as the others. Although, Linda, you're right, there was actually a fall in leverage, sorry, an increase in leverage among all types of banks, actually. It's just that this was a little bit more pronounced at the banks that seems to have received more inflows. And I don't see, I, I really don't think that this could be seen as a, a, as a positive thing, but uh, maybe we could uh, have further discussion about this. Thank you. So, Nectario Saslan, uh, wanted to know how many banks you have in your sample and why 
uh, you're using random effects instead of fixed effects in your panel regression. Do you want to go ahead, Stephanie? So we have uh, 137 banks, and uh, we just did the Hausman test, but it's pretty much uh, the same results uh, that we go for one or the other. Excellent. Um, I had kind of a question, uh, just sort of from the historical context and to make sure I understand. Um, I think of this as a kind of a period of great maelstrom, um, both in prices and the exchange rate and monetary stabilization and, and other sorts of things going on. So I'm almost surprised there's so much foreign deposits and that they're increasing sevenfold. Is there an exchange rate element in here that you're, how you're, how you're measuring them or, or is this real increases? Um, I think that's a really good question. We could investigate a bit more on this, but um, like we we have the value that it is for German banks. So where you have a point is that it comes in and some question is how do they manage? Uh, so I think on this, you I definitely will go back to you on it. Um, like we know that once it's then transferred, then the new value is there and it continues, but it's true. We're also quite surprised by the numbers that increase sevenfold uh, over time. Are you sure? Uh, I mean, the balance sheet is essentially an artifact uh, for how the bank records these, but are they converting them into local currency or are they keeping them in foreign currency? Do so what, he, what we have is really current at uh, the, the local currencies, like for all the things. That's why I say like, I, I, I could look deeper into it. Right now it's all local currency. And then the question is, do they actually convert it or not? And I actually don't have the, uh, the answer currently, but as Natasha said, it's the first time we present a paper, so. It's a lot of them were converted. They were in, in foreign currency, but it's true that the values that we have are in domestic currency, so yeah. Okay, we have one final question from Marco Mulcaney. Um, why don't you use Z score or standard deviation of ROA to a return on assets to proxy, proxy for risk? So it's about your, your measurement of risk and why you don't use some, I think we some kind of measure. Z -score here. Yeah. yeah, would be. It's just another way. Of, just yeah. a suggestion, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. Uh, we've now hit the time uh, for the end of the session. I think it was extraordinarily rich. Um, I wanted to apologize to all presenters that, um, that you didn't get as, as long as I know that you would have wanted to have, and indeed that we would have wanted to have, uh, to hear uh, about the complexities of these papers. But I hope that they've given our audience a, a taste and a flavor of the really exciting and in-depth types of research um, that we can undertake to look at those, those processes of cross-border banking um, and their links to the real and financial um, stability um, in, in times past, both in times of crisis um, and in times of globalization. So thank you very much to all the panelists and to all the question askers. Um, we don't have time Thank for you, a break. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we don't have time for a break, which seems really terrible of us to schedule it this way, um, but I hope you're able to take a little breather on your own. Um, and I'd like to introduce Rainer Klump now to uh, take control, uh, to take on the lion tamer um, uh, role for the next session. Rainer? Yeah, pleasure, pleasure, Catherine. Thank you very much. Uh, hello from my side. I'm Rainer Klump from Goethe University Frankfurt, also associated with the Institute uh, for Banking and Financial History. And I have the pleasure to chair to share this uh, second uh, panel session um, that, that will now go from the past to the present to, to give the full picture of uh, what, what is the subject of this, this conference. Um, as you can see from the program, we will have uh, three presentations. I would ask each presenter to uh, be not longer than 15 minutes. After each presentation, we would have uh, like five minutes for, for direct questions that can be answered. And, and then we will have um, um, uh, Loriana Pelisson, my dear colleague from Goethe University, uh, who is uh, discussing the whole 
of the of the three presentations uh, so then we will have a more general discussion and we should be ready by 4:30 uh in time because then we will have uh, claudia buch uh, vice president of bundesbank um, giving her keynote speech that will close uh, the conference so um i will ask the first uh, presenter then to to start uh, it's uh, Götz von Peter with the co-author uh, Tara Rice from the Bank of International Settlements uh, Götz I hope you are here with us yes Can you see so, just just a few words of introduction you're principal economist and deputy head of international banking and financial statistic statistics at BIS and uh, you hold a, a PhD from Columbia. Uh, and the title of your talk is uh, on the global interbank networks and the retreat of correspondent banking. So Gertz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope this works. Do you see it? Yes, yes. Excellent. Hello to all. Thanks for bringing us together. So I'll present mostly work that is uh, that we did uh, last year with two colleagues, Tara Rice and Kodrutza Bohr, both of the BIS. And if time allows, I'll introduce a data set um, I'm building now to try to extend uh, this research further. And um, so I welcome very much your suggestions. So basically, to understand the importance of correspondent banking, I think there's a very simple um, um, fact that one can appreciate, namely that most payment systems, even today, are domestic in scope and operate in a single currency. Um, what links those systems across borders is primarily internal markets of multinational banks and networks of bank relationships known as correspondent banking. And so what most models, uh, what most definitions of correspondent banking have in common is that the correspondent takes deposits owned by respondent banks in order to provide payments and other services to those banks, often across borders. And these arrangements are typically reciprocated so that banks can provide services to each other in their respective currencies and jurisdictions. And I'm sure that Catherine Schenk's Global Bank project will uncover fascinating facts on the expansion of these networks over time, over the last 150 years or so, and the resilience of these networks over time. Here today, I'll just speak about the recent declining trend we've seen over the past 10 years. And that raises the question, is this model of correspondent banking in a global retreat? And I'd like to you to focus on this yellow line that you see here, which shows that the number of active correspondent bank relationships worldwide has fallen by 22% over the past decade. And that tr trend continued in 2019 and may well continue in 2020. And that has raised the attention of various international organizations concerned about access and costs, especially to developing countries. Um, the CPMI uh, actually collects a, a nice chart pack for anyone interested in uh, more information and data on this. So the question is, why does this trend take place and should be worried about it? And so three reasons or three takes would be, yes, one worry could be the loss of access of individual countries to the global banking system, the rise in costs for cross-border payments, and the risks to financial integrity if non-banks or other unregulated entities are taking over the business of cross-border payments. So the data set we're working here is um, received from SWIFT. And SWIFT is a global um, platform uh, that allows for messaging between banks between more than 200 countries and jurisdictions. So that allows to map the payments network um, either at the bank to bank level or at the country to country level. Um, we're looking at the payments um, messages that are known as MT103. That's an on 
behalf of a customer payment or the MT202s, that's interbank payments from one country to another. So a, a payment message sent from one country to another identifies a corridor between countries and the count of active correspondence within each of these corridors is the AC measure that we're looking at in this um, paper. So as a simple illustration, country A has a, a, a cor corridor with the US and there is three correspondent bank relationships because there's two banks sending messages, payment messages to three distinct banks in the US. That's what the SWIFT measure of correspondent banks um, measures. So why then is there a retreat of correspondent banking, apparently? So one reason is um, surveys have found that banks have reassessed after the global financial crisis, their business strategies um, in a context, of course, of low profitability, dampened risk appetite, and tighter regulation and supervision. They also, these surveys also indicate that banks have increasingly been, they started to be worried about anti-money laundering and financing of terrorism regulations. And the compliance with those regulations has also led them to retreat from individual countries. And what we'd like to do here is to test for the generality of these factors. Now, the tricky part is that really requires a complete cross-section comprising as many countries as possible. Because if you look at, you know, which countries have lost the most or the highest percentage of active correspondence, you know, up to minus 100%, that's North Korea. And you see that most of these countries in the lower part of this distribution are countries that are either, you know, offshore centers or fatter high risk jurisdictions or countries sanctioned by the US. So these are, so in other words, an empirical, empirical regression needs to keep those countries that are somewhat marginal in uh, the data set. And so the testing down approach doesn't really work because if you put in all the regressors that you think might be important, you ending up with a data set of 20, 30 countries, uh, which are not the problem countries. And so what I've done here is to try to get to this with a, an approach known as global search, where I basically um, run a huge loop over thousands of regressions with each taking a subset of the regressors. And then for each regressor, I keep record of the point estimate of this regressor and build a distribution of the point estimates. And for those regressors where the point estimates are generally away from zero, that is an indication that for almost all or for many combinations of regressors in a regression, that regressor will show up as important. And so basically that allows me to have very, very parsimonious regressions. And I'll present one or two of those regressions in this slide. So here basically the regression is the percentage change in the number of active correspondents on country level variables in a large cross section, right? So this one has 177 countries. And what we see here is, first of all, the constant here indicates that this is a fairly broad based, you know, retreat. So on average, 20, 30%, as I've shown in the beginning of um, correspondent bank relationships have been lost worldwide. But looking at the various um, regressor estimate, uh, point estimates also shows that there are several significant variables that suggest that the drivers identified in the surveys and policy reports indeed help explain which countries lost more relationships. So the first block simply macro factors. So stronger growth consistently helps stem the decline. And of course, shrinking countries or crisis countries tend to lo lose more um, correspondent bank relationships. Trade growth 
also helps because of course facilitating trade has always been a key purpose of correspondent banking um, as we've seen in the very first presentation by Wilfried as well and size controls don't seem to matter that much in most specifications such as population growth or GDP um, but do help in very specific um, in very specific regressions for instance um, China, you know, nobody wants to lose access to, to China or wants to stop providing correspondent services to China, for instance, simply already because of its size. A second group of variables tries to capture regulatory compliance issues, right? So, for instance, um, jurisdictions that are widely designated as offshore centers here lost about 11 percentage points more active correspondence than other countries or indeed other financial centers. So that is indicative perhaps of these compliance costs in the face of anonymity and secrecy in those financial centers. So the designation of FATF risk status also accelerated the loss of um, the loss of active correspondence. And five minutes to go, Gertz. <laughs> yes. And the single most robust risk-related driver is a corruption index. So countries perceived to be more corrupt have lost systematically more um, correspondent bank relationships. Now, why would we care in a way? Because part of this retreat is in a way natural. If banks reassess their post-crisis business models differently now, um, maybe that's a normal development. And parts of this retreat are also intended because you know, there were efforts to enhance international financial integrity. And after all, the number of transactions and the value of cross-border payments globally continued to increase over those last 10 years. So in a way, why do we care? Well, one reason is the rise in costs, and I have some slides in the back of the uh, presentation that I probably won't get to, um, that show that costs in generally cross-border payments um, generally tend to fall in cost over time, but for those countries that have lost more correspondence, they fall at a slower rate. So uh, another concern is that loss of access. So basically, um, there's individual countries that have almost lost entirely access, um, such as North Korea, Somalia, and so forth. And now using the international banking statistics um, locational um, basically shows that most jurisdictions still maintain open corridors from and to BIS reporting countries. A very simple network analysis basically shows this, that if you take 200 from country, 202 countries, you get a matrix of about 40,000 entries. In at least 14, 15% of cases, the center country holds an interbank deposit with some bank in the receiver country. So that's kind of a direct relationship. In 74% of cases, the center country can route payments through a third country like the United States in the case of dollar uh, payments, for instance. In another 6% of cases, this payment chain works through two intermediaries, right? So for instance, from Mongolia to the UK, to the US, to Bolivia. Now eight destinations cannot receive and four cannot send this way. And most of those are smaller Pacific islands. So this is literal loss of access is quite a lot, an exception. Um, and here we can see that those countries that have lost both correspondence and corridors to other countries are actually the minority. So basically, in the minute or two that I have left, I'd like to just point out that I'd like to extend this kind of analysis in a more systematic way um, using an overlay of various uh, networks. Namely, I'm building um, this from to network for both trade and overlay the international banking cross-border positions 
from country to country, and as well, the present network. So that is, are countries headquartered in one country having a local presence in another country? And the, the white areas in each case indicate that I do not have the full network, but if you just look at the subnetwork for which I observe both That's banks and yeah. yes. yeah. mm -hmm. um, for those country pairs where I observe both trade and bank relationships, most countries connected through trade are also connected through banking, but only a minority is also connected through a physical bank presence. And, but that in the current context of the retreat of correspondent banking is quite interesting because the, if you rank the countries by the size of their trade relationship from small to large, the larger that trade relationship between two, two uh, countries, the more likely it is that they are also connected through a physical presence, which in the context of, um, in the context of correspondent banking might just mean our interna internal markets perhaps substituting for correspondent bank relationships. It's entirely possible that the global transaction banks are internalizing some of that correspondent banking business within the internal markets of their banking group. Now, with this kind of network, one could also do other kind of um, experiments. For instance, is there a sequence when countries develop that they first develop their trade and cross-border relationships and only then do they develop their bank presence with each other? All these are open questions and I'd love to hear your feedback on which kind of uh, areas are worth exploring with this. So I think in the interest of time, I'll conclude here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gertz, uh, that was very interesting to hear about this uh, changes in the structure of, of how these uh, international networks operate. Um, I have one question here from Linda Goldberg. How have countries with lost relationships due to sanctions and FATF risks, presumably costly losses, respond to those losses? Is there any evidence that this led to reforms or mainly a reorientation of trade and finance as you plan to explore? That's a great question. Um, I don't have an immediate answer, but I do know that some cases such as Somalia, for instance, when they lose corridors with the countries they receive remittances from, they try to establish few safe corridors, for instance, with the UK, where those um, compliance issues have been have been overcome so that you know, other countries can route their remittances through banks in the UK, for instance. Um, I don't have immediate evidence on how they reconfigure their trade relationships. And there's a World Bank report out that basically says they haven't found many, many extreme real uh, consequences of the loss of correspondent banks until it literally comes to a cutoff from access overall. Okay, thank you. I have three other questions in the q and I, I would then stop. So first question from Tony Moore. Uh, could the unexpected positive effect of US sanctions be explained by banks in those jurisdictions needing to establish new correspondent relations with non-US banks and maybe several such relationships to avoid going through the dollar area? So is there a shift into other networks? That's a very interesting question. I can't verify that with the data, with the SWIFT data, because that's really at the country level. It's an interesting thought. Um, and it's entirely possible that there is some kind of diversification going on there. But the, the, the estimated coefficient, I should say, is positive, but it is not significant. So I don't actually know whether it's positive. And in some regression, it was actually negative and significant. So that's not a terribly stable coefficient to really put an interpretation on. Okay, then we have a question from William Allen on Havala banking. Havala banking is an obvious and low cost alternative to regulated banking in countries regarded as risk by FATF criteria. Is there any sign that Havala has been increasing faster since correspondent banking started to decline? 
I would believe that there is a there has been recent quite strong growth in Hawala banking, but I must say I I do not know enough about it to really make a stand here and give you a good answer there. But it is quite plausible. But for all alternatives of correspondent banking, it is good to keep in mind that many of these alternatives don't necessarily substitute for correspondent banking, but they're just netting and aggregating. And at the end of the day, those nets still often need to be transmitted in one way or another through a correspondent banking network. Yeah, then a question from Raphael Heim. Uh, what, if anything, could be assumed from your analysis on the declining local banks connections on stability of the international banking system? Is that? That's a very broad question. I mean, one factor is that if you see volumes and value increase and the number of connections decrease, well, chances are that uh, concentration is increasing, right? Now, I think I'm quite neutral in terms of concentration. I mean, obviously extreme concentration on very, on a single counterparty can be and has is in regulatory terms also discouraged, but um, in the, when risk assessment and fixed costs are in play and banks have to comply with you know, anti-money laundering legislation and so on, in some sense, it is a natural and perhaps a good development if fewer banks are doing it that are able to implement you know, the, the, the correct risk controls. So I, you know, I wouldn't be jumping to conclusions here to whether that's actually a, a a bad development in some sense yeah. from the risk side it might be a good development yeah maybe we come back to that in the general discussion last question comes from catherine um, asking uh, whether the number of banks has shrunk either through failures of m a in money centers or in smaller developing countries and do banks keep their swift codes after they merge or do they give up a swift root number once they have merged um, yeah, well, if they merge, they will have, they, they will probably, well, a SWIFT code is unique to a particular branch or subsidiary in a country. So to the extent that they merge within a country, they would probably share or, or, or use just one SWIFT code. Um, now, is this due to M&A? We've tried to test for that, but don't have enough data to really rule that out. But most of the consolidation has with some important exceptions, of course, but most of the consolidation has really taken place before this entire decline, which is mostly taking, you know, taking pace 2012 and after. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it is really down to mechanical factors like consolidation. Okay, thank you very much, Götz. Thank you. For your presentation and the discussion, and we come to the next presentation. Um, by Beatrice Schäuble from the European Central Bank. Beatrice, who holds a PhD, I think, from Munich University, and she's now lead economist in the International Policy Analysis Division uh, in the Director General International and European Relations of the ECB. Um, the paper she's presenting is on swap lines in the global financial safety net, and it's co-authored by Hannah Engel-Jeringer and Alice Schwenninger. So Beatrice, floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So uh, I'm very happy to present at this conference uh, because there is something to most recent development to which Linda has already alluded at the beginning, and that is the role of swap lines in addressing crises. And that's of course very closely link, uh, linked to uh, risks in the, in the banking system as well. And given that swap lines are such a powerful tool, there's a surprising divergence in the understanding of how much they should be applied for, for different types of crises. And that's where our work comes in. So. Uh, this is uh, uh, joint work with Hannah from, from the Santa Ana University, Pisa, and Alice from Banque de France. So my key messages today will be that we have seen an increase in uh, the number of swap lines. We have seen an increase in the application of swap lines as a crisis fighting tool, but that is actually a result of financial globalization and that 
it reflects increased cross-border capital flows, increased cross-border FX exposure, and that the swap line use really in the past has differed between different types of prices and that this is also still the case. There are certain applications for swap lines for which they are a great tool and a powerful tool and we've seen that in the past, but that doesn't mean that they are one size fits all tool that should replace all other elements of the GFSM. And with these key messages, let me move to something, um, maybe to give you a little primer on the GFSN as an international lender of last resort to those who uh, have, don't, are, are not so much in, into this concept. So the global financial safety net is considered the kind of the different elements of the GFSN are considered the international lender of last resort. This chart gives you a development of the resources in the different elements of the GFSN since 1995, starting with the turquoise line which gives total stock of reserves that's sort of a country's first line of defense and the blue bars show imf quota resources which have been the most important second line of defense or global rather global line of defense uh, until the global financial crisis the yellow bars they also depict IMF resources but borrowed resources which have become more important after the global financial crisis and I could devote an entire talk to that, I won't, but if someone wants references or discussed, I'm, I'm happy to do so. And then something you can see in the orange bars, that's the regional financial arrangements, sort of regional funds to address uh, regional crises. They also have become more important after the global financial crisis. And then in green, that's the size of all bilateral agreed limited swap lines doesn't include unlimited swap lines. So the biggest chunk is actually left out of this chart. But something you can see very clearly is the increasing relevance of bilateral swap lines here. And so uh, a lot of the literature that has emerged recently has somewhat related this advent or this increasing relevance of swap lines to the fact that IMF may not be the best tool anymore uh, RFAs may not be the most powerful tool we need to focus on swap lines. And this is not new. So this is actually a thinking that has emerged already during the past, or let's say after the past crisis, after the global financial crisis, when the literature focused again on like, do we really need an inter like a global international lender of last resort? Is the IMF with its global membership not, not sufficient? So is there a theoretical foundation for an international lender of last resort? How should it look like? And then like this uh, strand of literature after the global financial crisis, I will divide it into those who said the GFSN is patchy, the different layers don't work well, it's full of holes, some countries are not covered, it needs improvement. Uh, I would consider myself and, and leave you at the time in, in, in the more agnostic corner saying, okay, the layers, they address different countries, different prices, they are complementary. Let's look into how they work together. And this discussion has sort of resurfaced since the uh, pandemic. Uh, after the global financial crisis, the IMF's toolkit has already been revamped with a more swap-like tool. And now since the pandemic, there, there has been a, a call for more swap lines because some authors said the GFSN is not fit for purpose, IMF and RFA lending is not enough, uh, the Fed needs to provide more swap lines. And I would also uh, include the new SDR allocation, which is uh, in, in the discussion into this because special drawing rights are sort of a claim on foreign currencies. So it's also about kind of providing more foreign currency funding to uh, the economy, to the banking systems of the countries which, which use them. So this is kind of what has come up since the crisis. Then there are some central bankers who more or less discuss rather about um, theoretical purpose of swap lines for addressing CIP deviations, uh, addressing mainly FX risk in, in normal times, but uh, it is clear that, that there's this call, there's some technical discussion, what, what is the real purpose of the swap lines, and we want to shed light on this. And we thought, okay, we really need better data. That's where our data set comes in. 
And I'll start with a brief history of swap lines in the international monetary and financial system. And the key mess that there are three key messages I would like you to take from the slide. So the first one is that swap lines did emerge in the 1960s. So together with, you may remember from the previous slide, the IMF 1952, RFAs 1977, 1978. So historically speaking, they emerged rather late. Previously, gold standard, not so much cross-border flows. There was just not, not so much need for addressing FX exposure. And then the interesting bit is that they emerged when there were cracks in the setup of the international monetary and financial system showing up. So this first US swap line is really nicely described in a paper by Michael Bordo et al. This emerged because under the then setup of the international monetary and financial system, the Bretton Woods system, there was an agreement that countries, central banks could exchange their US dollar reserves at a fixed rate for gold. The gold price rose. There were fears that the US would devalue the US dollar. So there was real, there were incentives, pressures uh, that other central banks could exchange their US dollar reserves for gold. And the first US swap line was actually intended to remove this foreign currency risk, this uh, US dollar uh, risk from the balance sheet of the foreign central banks. And these cracks, which started showing that uh, some of the setup of the Bretton Woods didn't work, of course, uh, it broke down uh, later. And so the third message uh, I want to give with this slide is we've moved into a system where flexible exchange rates, capital flows, the exchange rate as an adjustment mechanism, but also differences in interest rates creating CIP deviations have become much more normal. So having seen that the first US swap line showed up to address this FX risk, now with moving to a more hybrid international monetary and financial system with, these cap, uh, with uh, higher volumes of capital flows, with more FX exposure, we should really expect an increase in swap lines no matter what. And this is what I'm going to show you with our data. So it's not just a historical story which I'm telling, this is actually showing. This on the left-hand side, you see the same chart that I had shown before on GFSN resources, now all taken together in the blue bars and in the yellow line, you can see total IIP liabilities as a measure of global capital flows. And the GFSN has kept in pace more or less with financial globalization. The interesting bit is on the right-hand side because the swap line network has also grown more diverse. So up until prior to the global financial crisis, the global swap line network was more or less a US dollar network. And you can see that after the global financial crisis, there were more and more swap lines, um, the blue line you, you see on the right-hand side chart, in other currencies. So this swap line network is even more impressive if you look at it geographically. This you can see on, on this slide. Left-hand side shows you the swap line network in 1980 very much US dollar centered, very much centered around the US Fed versus the swap line network in 2020, which on this side, it even shows like being centered around the PBOC because the PBOC just has a really high number of swap lines. But of course, it's a different story when we, call, when we talk about US dollar swap lines. But mm -hmm. this, this is much more, more a network than, than in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Five minutes left, Beatrice. Thank you. So how was this network used, you know? Uh, given that this is a... Um, a conference on banking. So uh, my co-authors and I wanted to look into how much are swap lines drawn during banking versus currency crisis? So are they really a tool for FX crisis or not? And you can see on the left-hand side chart, which shows you the uh, agreed amounts during a crisis that advanced economies didn't, didn't really agree additional swap lines during neither banking nor currency nor twin crisis, 
emerging economies, however, agreed mainly IMF programs when they faced a banking crisis, not so much for a currency crisis, but no swap lines showing up. The orange part is the swap lines. Now, if you look at the drawn amounts, you can see that the advanced economies during a banking crisis actually drew a lot from the swap lines. But given that this doesn't show up in the agreed amount, this is mainly from unlimited swap lines and only US dollar because we only have drawn amounts from the US Fed. This is not the case for the emerging economies. So do we conclude from this that it's uh, mainly advanced economies which need US uh, dollar liquidity? Well, some, something that we also looked at was the FX exposure. Is it that advanced economies are more exposed to the US dollar? And indeed we see that we, when there's a higher gross external debt in terms of GDP, uh, both among banks in blue and non-banks in uh, uh, banks in green and non-banks in blue, then we see a higher agreed US dollar swap amount. We don't see this for emerging and developing economies on the right hand side. So there's a lot to learn, uh, a lot we don't know. Something we looked into was, does is this somehow related to currency invoicing? So we looked at the uh, share of export goods invoiced in US dollar on the horizontal axis versus the uh, uh, agreed US dollar swap amount. And again, we see a positive correlation for G7, top left-hand corner, no correlation for EMDCs, bottom left-hand corner. We do see some correlation for EMDCs uh, if the swap line is the uh, swap amount is not too high in terms of GDP for euro invoicing and euro swap lines on the bottom left hand corner. So I've shown you some descriptive evidence, some stuff that you can do with our data. Um, a lot of open questions we would like to understand more. Something that we have done to better understand the role of swap lines is that we've looked a bit into the question, what is their role in, in addressing sudden stops? And for this, we've used a parsimonious model that uh, we've used to understand the spillovers from monetary policy and how monetary policy affects the likelihood of a sudden stop. So what we did here was to use a simple conditional log-log model Left-hand side variable is just a dummy variable on a sudden stop here in portfolio bond flows. That's uh, the usual Forbes and Warnock methodology. I won't go into detail uh, of this. On the right-hand side, we just put a few control variables. One important variable you see in the, in the first red box, which is the federal funds rate, later on shadow rate, second box, bottom of the slide, different measures of swap lines. Yeah. And you one minute, see, one minute. Yes, thank you. And you can see in the coefficients on that slide that there's a consistent effect of US, the US monetary policy stance on the likelihood of a sudden stop after the crisis. Whereas this is not the case for the swap line measures. There's some mitigating effect on the from if you, if we use the total agreed US dollar amount as a percent of GDP, but the magnitude is lower than the magnitude of the uh, federal funds rate and also much lower than regional contagion. This is not causal. A lot of GFSN variables still need to be included. We're fully aware of that. It's just to highlight that there might be uh, different tools for different types of crisis. And that's also our mm -hmm. conclusion. Mm -hmm. So the swap line network has kept pace with financial globalization. It reflects FX exposure. There is a different use of swap lines during, uh, of, uh, during currency versus banking crisis. And we need to understand more, but our early results indicate indeed something that we found also for other GFSN elements, that each GFSN element is working best in the crisis, uh, in the type of crisis for which it was designed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Beatrice, uh, here comes one question from William Allen. 
you mentioned that after the global financial crisis that there was a more diverse network of swap lines, but as far as one can tell from the data, the large majority of the swap line drawings has been in dollars from the Fed. So is it the case that the non-dollar swap lines are unimportant in practice and the Fed has been the international lender of last resort? Yes. <laughs> 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 on, on the data, on the data first. So, swap line data are usually very confidential, and the Fed is the only central bank which makes public its drawings. And this is a database which we want to share widely. So we could only include the data which is available. This means that the drawn amounts are only Fed amounts, but it doesn't mean that the others weren't drawn. So that's the first one. The second one, um, is it really just the Fed? Um, now, I, I have to be careful what I say, but let's say the international monetary and financial system is still very US dollar centered. And that means that any provision of US dollars is, is the most powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, there are other central banks which also provide swap lines in US dollar. So some Asian ones, for example, um, but the, the amounts are obviously not as big as any amount that you that, that the Fed could grant. Mm -hmm. That nicely fits to the question that comes here from uh, uh, Catherine, uh, saying that not all swap lines are for the same purpose. Uh, for example, we have uh, Fed swaps for local dollar auctions, but PBOC for trade finance in Remimbi, so in China. The question is then, is it useful to group these different kinds of swaps together? Uh, that's actually a very important point, which I always make when I talk about swap lines, because that's missing in the academic debate, that these swap lines actually have different purposes. And you might have seen on my history that even treasuries can give swap lines. So some, some of the uh, Chiang Mai initiative swap lines are actually originating from treasuries. <laughs> so yes, this is very important. For the purpose of this talk, we have actually grouped them together because it's, uh, I mean, it's still a, a really nice network, but the database allows you to differentiate. So we have in the database, not only the, the data set up in Excel and in Stata format, but we also have an explanatory Excel file, which actually has uh, detailed text boxes on the purpose of each swap line. Catherine, do you have a follow up on that? Or you're fine? No, I was just mouthing, thank you. So. <laughs> okay, so next question comes from Linda. Linda, you would like to, to uh, ask uh, directly? So yeah, little... just, well, just the, what's your perspective on the possible effects of the new FEMA repo facilities? <laughs> so I have not included, uh, well, we haven't included and I haven't talked about uh, neither FEMA nor uh, ECB repo facility. So we, we also implemented one. I think they're really a uh, great addition. And so far we haven't really considered them as, as part of the GFSN, but uh, these these gaps, which have always been uh, yeah lamented, that swap lines are only available to a very specific club, that sort of can be alleviated a bit and say by 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 repo facilities. So, I mean that they, they haven't been there for a long time, but um, I think they they will prove a, an, an important element of the GFSM. Mm -hmm. Okay, then last question comes from uh, Dagmar Alpen uh, asking whether your data set includes the time of the pandemic. And if so, did banks behavior change in 2020? So it does include the swap lines from 2020, but uh, it's only a very, it's only very, very few. So the, the behavior or the, let's say, whether a country gets a swap line, uh, this is something you can analyze with the data. So you can just use a, a simple zero one dummy on the left hand side and then put in certain determinants on the right hand side. Um, my impression is that swap lines have been uh, used um, like they've used before, 
uh, like they have been used before and um, they, they have been an important element, even though I should say the, the current crisis is different from the global financial crisis. So Linda has, has nicely elaborated on this, uh, on the funding pressure among banks during the global financial crisis. And this was a crisis that originated in the banking sector, whereas the pandemic is, is a real sector crisis. Um, so this is also why you've seen, for example, a much larger fiscal response uh, early on than, for example, during the global financial crisis. Yeah, Linda, would you have another question? I think we have all the questions taken. So thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. And we come to our third um, presentation and uh, that bringing into the broader picture also the non-banking institutions. And uh, this is a presentation by Inaki Alda Soro, who works with the uh, BIS uh, as an economist at the Monetary and Economic Department. Uh, he holds a PhD from Goethe University in Frankfurt. And the talk is about um, cross-border links between banks and non-bank financial institutions. Inyaki. So um, first, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Lina, Catherine, organizers more broadly for, for giving me the chance to present this uh, recent article on cross-border links between banks and, and non-bank financial institutions and BFIs. This is joint work with um, my BS colleague, uh, Wenchan Huang, and with ST Kem from the FSB Secretariat. So the usual disclaimer for the two organizations uh, applies. Now, um, MBFIs have played an important role in transmitting uh, shocks during the great financial crisis. And since then, uh, their assets have only grown uh, substantially at a faster pace than, the, than, than, than banks' assets. And this is well documented in FSB reports. Um, of particular concern, concern are the, the links between banks and NBFIs, which are key, uh, quote unquote, uh, conjunctions in the financial system. Uh, and as both uh, type of institutions, banks and, and NBFIs can engage in credit, maturity, liquidity transformation, uh, which could underpin accumulation of imbalances in normal times and also accumulate into pockets of stress during, during downturns. And, and the, these links between banks and NBFIs were behind particularly powerful transmission mechanisms, uh, as demonstrated during the, during the COVID market turmoil, which underscore uh, several items. For one, that central, uh, central counterparty margins can be procyclical and drain, uh, drain banks' liquidity at an inopportune time, that money market funds can be fickle funding sources, uh, fickle funding source for, for banks. And that also banks' positions vis-a-vis -vis NBFIs can also contribute to net long currency positions that then um, materialize in, in, uh, in dollar funding shortages for, for banks. And all of these lessons had an important cross-border dimension. So what this article tries to do is a first attempt at a global mapping of, of these cross-border links between banks and NBFIs. Uh, we use the BIS international banking statistics and focused mainly on the residence of um, of, of the of the counterparties and this is going to be more like the first section was uh, the first session was sort of purely historical the the second one was more modern and this is going to be within the modern more uh, conjunctural even uh, and and less of a research type more of a, a stylized fact finding sort of exercise so first um, a brief note on the data. So the BIS uh, locational banking stats uh, capture links between banks that are located. In a, in a given jurisdiction and the NBFI sector in another jurisdiction. It is important always to bear in mind that these data are reported by banks, so they will reflect a bank's perspective. So when we talk about claims, it's always gonna be bank claims on NBFIs, and when we talk about liabilities, it's always gonna be bank liabilities vis-a-vis -vis NBFIs. Um, and these two, those, these two types of institutions are, are linked directly and indirectly, and the BIS data capture a subset of these linkages, namely direct uh, claims and liabilities. And this graph illustrates how these linkages could enter banks' balance sheets. Uh, so, for instance, if a bank if a bank would invest in in a CLO or extend loans to to finance companies, this would show up on bank assets as as claims on NBFIs, uh, and in turn, bank liabilities could reflect funding from say MM, MMFs by by say repos or commercial paper or more broadly deposits from NBFIs among others. 
uh, credit lines are uh, which were as pointed out in, in some of the presentations before uh, an important aspect and important development in the in q1 last year are off balance sheet commitments that are going to appear to the extent that they are to the to the extent that they are drawn uh, they will appear as both loans and the corresponding deposits something that is very important to to keep in mind here uh, throughout the presentation uh, and when looking at the at the data if you if you go and browse it on the bis website is that we only see positions vis-a-vis -vis ABFI as a sort of collective uh, and the MBFI collective. So we do not know whether the counterparty is, say, an investment fund or a hedge fund or a CCP and so on. And I will come back to this later. So bank uh, cross-border claims uh, and liabilities with the MBFIs grew strongly in recent years. So here we start in 2015, which is uh, when the when a uh, significant amount of reporters start reporting this, uh, this breakdown in the BI statistics. Uh, it grew from about 4.6 trillion in the first quarter of 2015 to 7.5 trillion in the first quarter of 2020. So there is a notable increase in, in, in volume, but there is also a notable increase in terms of a share of, of total cross-border uh, claims uh, and, and liabilities, as you can see in the left-hand panel. And as you can see in the center panel, the US dollar dominates these uh, cross-border positions with, with NBFIs. Uh, with more than 50% of both uh, claims and liabilities uh, being denominated in, in US dollars. And finally, the cross-border links between banks and NBFIs exhibit a high degree of geographical concentration. Uh, now, granted, the, the concentration is a, is a feature of cross-border banking more broadly, as we have documented in other, in other work uh, in, the, in the BIS quarterly review. Uh, but it is particularly high and rising uh, with respect to non-bank financial institutions, as we illustrate in the right-hand panel of the graph by means of, of um, standard HHI indicators. And this concentration can be clearly seen in this network graph, which probably guaranteed my participation in a network uh, bank, network, interbank network conference. Uh, and the, the left-hand panel here plots the network of bank uh, cross-border claims on NBFIs uh, as of the first quarter of last year. Uh, the size of the nodes is uh, proportional to the value of the links. Uh, the color of the link shows the location uh, of the of the bank that holds that holds a claim, and the width of the of the of the links is proportional to the value of the claim. So, for instance, if you look uh, at uh, the UK and and the US, if we if we want to capture claims of banks that are located in the US on NBFIs located in the United Kingdom, these are captured by the green link between the green and purple nodes uh, here. And um, if you want, in turn, to capture the, the, the opposite link, so the, the, this is the, the purple link going in the other direction, this will capture the, the claims of banks located in the United Kingdom on NBFIs located in, in the United States. And of course, the same logic applies to the, uh, to the network of, uh, of liabilities. Now, the patterns across claims and liabilities and across counterparty countries, so crossing these two dimensions, can shed light on the type of NBFIs with which uh, banks have cross-border positions. And this brings me back to the point of the fact that we, we don't really know exactly which type of NBFIs behind these positions. So, for instance, banks in Japan have sizable claims on NBFIs in offshore financial centers, and this is going to be mostly Cayman Island. This is the, the orange bubble on the left. Uh, and this probably reflects banks' holdings of, of securities such as CLOs, which are issued by securitization vehicles that are uh, located in, in these jurisdictions. This is well documented in a lot of uh, say newspaper articles and so on, and also in the reporting of some of the banks. Uh, the claims of banks in the US on NBFIs in offshore financial centers also probably reflect similar activities as well as prime brokerage business with, with hedge funds. It is also likely that central clearing contributes to the strong links that we observe between the UK and the US as both host internationally active uh, CCPs, banks in the euro area and in other advanced economies like Canada and Australia, which are captured all in the blue node, um, have substantial claims on, on NBFIs uh, in European financial centers. And here we take together Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands uh, and, and Switzerland. Uh, and European banks also have large claims on NBFIs in the, in the US as well reflecting exposures to US finance companies and US SPVs as has been documented in detail in a paper by, by Richard Portes and co-authors from a couple of years back. Now, you see here that EMEs are, are very small, right? So this is because the, the positions between, uh, between advanced economies and offshore centers just dominate by the sheer size, but it is worth pointing out that the cross-border links between uh, banks and NBFIs have also grown uh, quite a bit in EMEs in recent years. 
Uh, and they can represent a substantial share of overall cross-border claims and liabilities for these countries, as you can see in the left panel here. So in other words, while in the network before they 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 looked sort of uh, marginal, from the perspective of, of VMEs, uh, the role of MBFIs is certainly non-negligible. And it has been growing strongly. And similarly, as, as, it, as it was the case for, for the total positions um, that we saw in, in the first graph a couple of slides back, the US dollar also looms large for, uh, for, some, for some EMEs, as you can see in the right-hand panel. Yeah, five minutes, Sinyaki. Thank you. Now we go to the, to the most conjunctural part of all, so the vulnerabilities with, with, um, uh, during, the COVID, uh, during the COVID market uh, turbulence in March last year, which uh, they surfaced very strongly in, in, the, in terms of the bank and BFI links. So on one hand, banks uh, claim on certain MBFIs, such as hedge funds, uh, increased financial leverage. And during the severe financial stress that was caused by the pandemic fallout, the unwinding of these leverage positions exacerbated fire sale and drained market liquidity, as was well documented by, by colleagues in a series of BIS bulletins. And in addition, banks' links with CCPs uh, can transform banks' uh, counterparty credit risk into liquidity risk. And on the other hand, banks increasingly rely on NBFI, such as MMFs, for, for short-term funding, which can suddenly dry up and, and cause market disruptions. More broadly, the cross-border links between banks and NBFIs will tend to underpin effects positions that can generate liquidity and, and maturity mismatches, as I mentioned earlier. So the, the bank cross-border claims on NBFIs saw a like, really substantial spike in the first uh, quarter of 2020 of roughly um, 800 billion sorry, uh, US dollars. Uh, which could be partly the result of drawdown of credit lines from 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 NB, uh, from uh, from banks. Uh, we see in the left hand panel, in the first panel on the left, that NBFIs located in the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Cayman Islands accounted for much of this expansion. These are the first three uh, set of stack bars, uh, and most of which was U.S. dollar denominated, as you can see with the with the red uh, the red bars in the in the graph. Uh, increases in bank cross-border claims on NBFIs in the UK and Japan also probably reflected in part gains on centrally clear derivative positions with CCPs that are located there. So we see in, this, in the second panel that historically changes in cross-border bank claims on NBFIs in the UK and Japan have tended to correlate positively with changes in CCP initial margins in, in, the, same, in the same countries. Uh, and you see how, how much of an outlier the, the first quarter of 2020 was uh, with very large margin calls as, as CCP sort of stepped up their protection uh, from, from counterparty risk, which generated a sudden and, and massive increase in margins um, that in turn generated the liquidity strains for clearing member banks. Now, as the third panel shows, uh, also cross-border bank liabilities, two NBFIs uh, were, also, were heavily affected by the March turmoil. The, the increase was of about 780 billion in the first quarter of, of uh, last year, which was exceptional uh, by, by any standard. And just as with changes in claims, NBFI, NBFI uh, drawdown of credit lines uh, can, can play a role here because as the credit lines are drawn, they generate the corresponding increase in, in deposits uh, at, at banks. Uh, furthermore, to the extent that the CCPs are actually intermediating between banks that are on opposite sides of the real contracts, gains on, on contracts for, for some banks, which are claims on NBFIs, would go hand in hand with losses for other banks, which are liabilities to NBFIs. And this could partly explain the increase in bank liabilities vis-a-vis -vis NBFIs located in the US and the UK. Uh, it is important to also note that the expansion of bank liabilities uh, to NBFIs in the first quarter must underline vulnerability that can stem from some funding sources. I mentioned that here I have in mind particular US MMFs. But also banks rely on offshore financial centers for the US dollar funding from NBFIs, as, as we saw also in the, in the network graph before. Uh, and the importance of these centers in bank cross-border liabilities uh, to NBFIs is linked with that of the US dollar, as we show in the fourth panel. Uh, the NBFIs in these offshore financial centers, think of hedge funds, MMFs, other investment funds, they tend to have a short investment horizon and they can amplify dollar funding stress for, for, uh, for banks. Uh, so we also look into the role of NBFIs, uh, the, trying to dig deeper into this issue of, of uh, dollar funding shortages. We, we shift uh, gears and, and switch the, to the statistics aggregated by bank nationality. So we no longer focus on, uh, say, um, German banks, uh, sorry, on uh, banks in Germany, and we instead focus on, on German banks throughout, uh, throughout the world. One and minute. Thank you. The data reveals uh, apparent net long positions in, the, in dollars vis-a-vis uh, -vis NBFIs, as you can see in the left-hand panel, in the mismatch between red bars, uh, negative and positive. Uh, and this will 
tend to contribute to apparent uh, net long positions vis-a-vis -vis all counterparties, as you can see in the right-hand panel. Now, banks will typically hedge these positions via FX swaps, so they will eliminate or reduce uh, currency mismatches, but the short maturity of these instruments typically generates liquidity mismatches, which leaves banks vulnerable to US dollar funding shortages, and such shortages took center stage during the, during the COVID crisis, um, as is well documented. So in the interest of time, I will not repeat the main conclusions of what, what I said, but just let me point out that uh, that our, our article, while it adds to understanding of NBFI bank uh, nexus, it also points to important data gaps, which is very important to fill uh, if we are to, to gain a fuller picture of, of financial vulnerabilities and, and, and the related transmission channels. And these dimensions include um, cross um, domestic exposures between banks and NBFIs. Here we concentrated only on cross-border. Also, the specific type of NBFIs that banks have uh, uh, have as counterparties. Is it a CCP? Is it an investment fund? Is it a hedge fund? And so on. The exposures within the NBFI sector, which is a full blank uh, uh, for the data that I'm aware of, uh, and also the financial instrument underpinning all of exposures. Uh, and given that I'm under the watchful eye of uh, the deputy head of the banking statistics, I also want to strongly encourage you to browse the interactive graph that we have put together with this piece in the in the quarterly review. Uh, which I hyperlink in the slides and you can also find in the web. It allows you to see the network graph uh, over time by currency, split by uh, uh, claims, liabilities, and, and net positions, uh, and all uh, downloadable, by the way. Okay. So l let me stop sharing, and I think I Thank you very much. was Thank right you on time. Much. Are there questions from the audience? Yeah, here comes from a question from Catherine. Is it possible that some NFBIs are subsidiaries or otherwise related to banks? So there is an internal capital market function observed. I think in principle, it, it is possible. I think in the data that we, that we have used, uh, this is uh, stripped out because you can, um, you can uh, separate out intra-group positions uh, with the location uh, with the location of banking statistics mm -hmm. uh, and this is sort of net of those mm -hmm. okay other questions if that's not the case may maybe we come back uh, to this uh, after the next mm -hmm. uh, presentation or oh, it's no, not a presentation thank you yaki so far uh, now Thank we you. come to the, um, well, what is called the discussion, which is led by my chair, my dear colleague, uh, Loriana Pellizzon, Professor of Finance at Goethe University and uh, also Research Director at the Leibniz Institute SAFE. Uh, Loriana, you hold a PhD from London Business School. And uh, well, you have the floor to discuss the three presentations that we have just heard. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, you know, to read uh, and look to these uh, three very interesting papers. Clearly, uh, I don't have too much time and uh, I'm not going deeply on, uh, uh, on each of them. So I will just say a few things regarding all the three and then I will try to, let's say, um, pose several questions that uh, will affect or will be related to all the three, let's say, papers and what we are learning from these three papers that are largely describing how is this uh, interconnection among, you know, the flows uh, or institutions, financial institutions across the, the world. Uh, but clearly, the evidence that, they, that these three papers are providing uh, is pretty much rising, I think, a lot of questions. And I'm just, you know, putting these questions. That's my, uh, the way in which I, I prepare my discussion. So the first paper uh, is from my point of view, investigating this research question. What is driving the retreat of correspondent banks and what are the potential consequences? And if I want to, you know, to sum up uh, uh, the, the key point that it has been raised. So the paper is documenting a significant reduction in correspondent banks. And uh, it is in a sense trying to disentangle what are the main reasons for this. And one is business model, since you know that uh, holding this type of correspondent banking is too costly. Uh, it seems that there is some role in terms of regulation and clearly uh, under regulation, we have all the uh, 
the aspect related also to uh, let's say corruption and the uh, the attempt to reduce uh, uh, some to penalize some countries and so on. In my view, there is one aspect that uh, uh, it has not been stressed too so much in that paper, and is uh, if the payment system for remittances uh, are, is now in the hand of non-bank financial institutions, thanks, for example, to the technological development. I'm giving below two exa three examples, but uh, this aspect, the technological development, it has been captured a little bit in the paper by telephone transfer and also by uh, as an explanatory variable, the internet, the level of internet connection that is seems also to be a relevant variable to explain the reduction in the correspondent banking. So I think that it would be nice to try to investigate more if uh, actually mostly maybe when there are barriers imposed by government on transferring money from one country to the other, there are other ways, you know, to still transfer money, like, for example, via Bitcoin or in general, Coinbase, let's say, transactions that clearly are not uh, um, included in the, uh, I think, in the statistics that we are looking so far. Or, for example, transfer wise, that just to give an idea, I hope that I think that all of you knows how it's working, but pretty much transfer wise or wise, this new company. It has been set up that, to my knowledge, is largely used. A lot of friends of mine are using it, so uh, I, I don't have statistics, but I think it is relevant. Pretty much, you know, use the account within the countries to transfer money across countries. So this is the, the idea behind this, uh, this platform. And by the simple fact that, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this platform exists, you have that correspondent banking uh, transaction are going to reduce. So it will be nice to have a focus and try really to disentangle how much of this reduction is due to the technological change. That's regarding the first paper. Regarding the second paper, well, it's a very complicated paper and uh, it's also trying to answer an extremely important question. So what is the role of swap lines? And are they really global financial safety nets? Uh, it is very nice because uh, you know it's giving to us a, a, a very nice feature on the evolution also of these swap lines, on the fact that they are not just related to the U.S. dollar, but uh, you know they are growing uh, also uh, regarding other type of uh, of currencies. So it is something that has been heavily used now by all the different central banks. So it seems that it's really having an important role. And uh, in fact, what they show is that uh, they are respond largely for, to forex flows or exposure. And uh, clearly they are trying to dig a little bit more, but, uh, uh, and they say that maybe it's due to the data they have, but uh, it seems that this is related to the key role play played not only by the Fed, but by the dollar in general. And this is why it's making the, the, the swap lines for the dollar so relevant. And then they are trying also to try to understand when are these uh, uh, swap lines relevant? When are they used the most? And clearly it's coming by a crisis, but uh, it depends also on which type of crisis. So, you know, currency crisis and bank crisis maybe they have uh, a different demand in terms of these warp lines. But for this paper, I have a more general question. And that it is the following. What and where are the frictions that prevent the market to work without the global financial safety net regarding, you know, dollar? Because even inside that we are talking about uh, this, uh, uh, the possibility to get, uh, uh, you know, dollar in the repo market via, you know, involving still the Fed, but via uh, providing as collateral treasury bills. Why the market is not able to do it by itself? What is the friction? You know, this type of analysis are very nice because they are describing really what is going on. But uh, uh, as a researcher, I would like to, that if it is possible to do a step further, where are the friction? Why is the market alone is not able to provide this type of safety net? Uh, and is not, you know, able to um, 
to provide uh, this type. So is it a, an issue regarding the amount of cash? Dollar is too much demanded and there is not demand, it, there is scarcity of the dollar. Uh, there are some conditions under which the dollar is scarce. You know, it would be very nice to tend to measure how much is this scarcity and how much these warp lines, you know, are just the, the, the signal of scarcity or maybe the signal of some other fr uh, friction in the market. Well, regarding the last paper, again, it is a fantastic analysis on the cross-border links between banks and non-bank financial institutions and how this has been evolved through time. And uh, what is coming out is that this type of linkages cross-border uh, are increasing uh, and you know, they have grown 63% in the last five years to 7.5 trillion, just to give an idea of how large it is. And they're trying, you know, also to figure out what are the vulnerabilities of their linkages that uh, has been significantly increased with the COVID-19 shock. They identified two main, uh, let's say, vulnerabilities. One is the procyclicality of the CCT margin. And again, the other is going back even to the previous paper, the dollar funding from uh, non-bank financial institutions. Um, but I think that uh, it will be nice to explain uh, why we have this trend, you know, because this problem about uh, uh, the dollar, the demand for, uh, for, for dollar, it was present even before. So now, why now this is done by non-bank financial institutions? So uh, again, what is the main driver? It is just regulation that is imposing more is imposing the CCP and therefore the margin, or there is something behind this. So uh, what are the economic functions of the different non-bank financial institutions that are going really to increase this type of cross-border linkages? Uh, so if it is maturity mismatch of other similar function of banks, such as cash management vehicles that the non-bank financial institution are uh, in a sense implementing, Observing this increase in, increase in the growth, this clearly is asking for a regulation because pretty much banks are putting out of their balance sheet, again, a lot of their activities in terms of maturity mismatch and cash management that we know that when they are doing this, they're out of the radar and uh, it is largely for regulatory arbitrage. So, uh, it would be very nice to figure out if uh, the result of this trend is because the system is becoming more efficient or, you know, it is just because we have a trend in uh, regulatory arbitrage that is going to increase or something else. Mm -hmm. I'm going now trying to have an overview of all these different... Uh, uh, Five minutes? Yes, I'm, I'm almost, almost done. Yes about all these different papers. And uh, so the picture, the overall picture that we have is that international financial linkages are increasing. The only corresponding banking linkages is reducing. And we still don't understand why this is the case. But the trend in general is that these linkages are increasing. So clearly, I think that we need after this three different evidence, we need to ask and try to answer to the question of what are the main drivers of this increase of the cross-border linkages? And where are going all this money? You know, Because linkages means that there is a lot of money going from one place to the other and maybe go back again. So the question is, why are we having all this money going around? Are they driven by trades? Are they driven by investment? Are they driven by lending? You know, what is behind? And what are, and why in some sense, uh, uh, we have that uh, a fraction of this type of um, movement are moving now away from the banking radar but still we have the bank involved uh, because as the graph, it has been shown, uh, among bank assets and, and bank liabilities, now we have always a non-financial, uh, a non-banking financial, a non-bank financial institution. So are we simply increasing the number of the intermediaries? So what before it was done by banks 
in an internalized way. It is now going out from the balance sheet of the banks and then go back again to the balance sheet of the banks. So clearly we're just increasing the chain, the, 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 let's say the chain, but and maybe reduce the efficiency because we are putting markets then in the middle that are subject maybe to fire sale and so on. When all these type of activities before were done internally in the balance sheet of the banks. And you know, it would be nice to understand better this type of pattern. Uh, and if at the end, since there is a concentration also, this is what is coming out from the last paper in terms of um, uh, non-bank financial institutions, you know, uh, is there then a concentration on risk on borrowers? So at the end, you know, we have some, uh, some bottleneck on where money are going from one place to the other. And, and, and the main question I think is, who is at the end with all this flow, the financial sector serving, serving with the cross-border linkages? Really looking to all this graph, you get the feeling that you know, there is a, an, an intensification of the money going from one place to the other. There are also a lot going to this Cayman Island that it would be nice to understand why there is all this need to go on these type of places. But you know, um, we cannot just document this type of flows. We need to try to understand why we have this type of flows. Okay. Thank you very much, Loriana. You did a very, very good job. And I think we can now start with uh, giving the three presenters the opportunity to react to the questions you raised to the three papers, and then we can go ahead with a more general discussion. So Götz, would you like to start? Uh, thanks for this uh, effort in putting uh, under one umbrella all these three diverse papers. So um, you're raising a lot of interesting questions, which I think within the few minutes we have, um, we can't quite answer. But on your specific questions uh, on uh, my um, presentation, so you're quite right to say we haven't gone long, far enough with exploring um, how new technologies and new uh, you know, NBFIs that use new technologies like TransferWise and uh, Revolut and so forth are shaping um, the landscape of correspondent banking. Uh, that is true. Now, I would only just say it's not a foregone conclusion that, you know, having more technology-based payment solution doesn't necessarily obviate the need for, uh, for correspondent banking because even though some of these... Um, so even though some of these uh, firms can be viewed as netters, they will certainly contribute to reducing the amount that's, that is um, transferred through this mechanism, but they're not necessarily uh, precluding that, you know, they, you still need the infrastructure because if for instance, transfer wise, as you rightly point out, is using local bank deposits uh, in each country in order to uh, offset and make payments across countries, but any imbalance, you know, between what it, what, what it pays to and from any country pair would still in a way have to be settled in some way. And for that, it would still use the banking system. And for that, it would still use uh, correspondent banking. But um, that's certainly a space worth uh, watching further because, and there's a very large uh, CPMI effort. Uh, Tara Rice and the co-authors actually intimately involved with this, try to make a very big international push to try to make cross-border payments cheaper and to bring in infrastructures, to link infrastructures. And so that's a very interesting space to keep watching. So I think with this, I'll leave it to, uh, to other commentators. Can I just add one thing on, on your point? I perfectly agree with what you say, but you know, there is also a secondary effect that when you are transacting only the net, then the business model that you already pointed out, uh, it maybe is not any more profitable. Uh, it is not the same as having transaction for the gross or having transaction only for the net. So that's why I think uh, the business model also is yeah. going to be bringing to the picture. 
Yeah, you're quite right with that. And certainly also you might in the process be consolidating uh, the net payments with a financial center where you can reconcile Girls, better. I'm very sorry, I have to stop you in, in, the, in the sake of uh, time. We also have to want, want to give the others the opportunity to react. Yeah, thank you very much for your understanding. Beatrice, please. This will be very difficult because uh, Loriana has asked this super broad question for me. What are the frictions that prevent the world to work without the GFSF? <laughs> um, I tried to give you a few thoughts and keep them very brief, but um, just to say that your comment on understanding the frictions uh, is really spot on. There's so much we don't know. So I just give you a couple of ideas on origin, uh, what are the frictions in between and why we, why, do, why we want to address them. So on the origin, I wrote down two points. One is globalization, one is exorbitant privilege. So an international monetary and financial system centered around the US dollar and its setup creates incentives for the buildup of imbalances. And understanding this, um, these imbalances is the first step to understanding kind of where, where and how we need the GFSN and what are the flaws of the IMFS. Globalization intensifies this whole thing. Uh, globalization tells us uh, kind of or, or intensifies flows and therefore also an intensifies the, the possibility for the buildup of imbalances and spillovers. Then, of course, we need to better understand, uh, even with these uh, systemic uh, or with the setup of the system, there are frictions in the system. And I've just uh, written down trade invoicing, which is something historical, which, uh, which drives these, uh, these flows and uh, also uh, is one reason why, why deviations from or opportunities of arbitrage may be used and may be emerged. Also a lack of domestic financial uh, markets in when I think about emerging economies. But uh, taxation is also one of the frictions um, which drives international flows, which, which is very relevant. But in some is also a, a big data question. We don't like the, the international capital flow data that we have is so deficient that uh, having better data, bilateral flows, data where data is going would be good. Why do we need the GFSN? Just three words or th uh, three points. One is, of course, we need to consider other, other effects than, than just efficiency. We, we might have financial stability considerations. We might have distributional effects. Uh, we might have inefficiencies. Um, in the banking system. So uh, yeah, there were so many things coming to my mind, but uh, I think your, your, your question is really well taken and spot on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Beatrice. And I hand over to Inyaki. <laughs> So um, first, uh, thanks a lot, Loriana. I, I second the gets in saying that uh, uh, very good job in sort of putting everything uh, together in a single um, wide-ranging uh, comment i think you raise a lot of <laughs> a lot of questions which are which are very deep and uh, like why do we have this this trend i think the the what i can say is that the way i would think about these issues is i would first start uh, by by sort of com com like separating the things in, in compartments so these nbfis are very different animals and we need to understand and get better data on 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 each of them because each of them will have very different implications if you think about, for instance, insurance companies and pension funds, which will be lumped together in the data that, that we have here, uh, that I that I have presented, uh, this this will behave typically more like anticyclically. Will not will not have the same financial stability implications as the behavior of hedge funds uh, and uh, and how they unwind positions under stress. Uh, to what extent? I mean, and this also implies to what extent um, regulation plays a role, uh, and for that, one also needs to distinguish the different type of NBFIs. Uh, you mentioned CCPs. I mean, yeah, there are the margins there, uh, and this was cl very clearly regulation-driven. Uh, there was a strong uh, push towards central clearing of derivatives, especially post-crisis. But there were good reasons for this. So, if the if there are issues with with the procyclicality of margins, they need to be better understood. Uh, 
analyze and 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 and, and then contain. Something similar applies to MMFs, where a creature are a creature that ex have have existed for a very long time. Some people would say that they their birth was sort of regulatory driven because of regulation Q, Q in the US, and that and that's how what what got them started uh, uh, as a, as an alternative to bank deposits. Uh, the, the rates of which were capped, uh, but I mean they have been there for a long time, and sort of they have established themselves as a very important source of dollar funding for U.S. banks, and and it's to me it's it's that linkage with the banks that is that is of critical importance uh, in understanding, and when it comes to to analyzing these very these sort of sub markets, there are data that are more granular that can help in in addressing those, and I think that that's the work that. Uh, that I see uh, more more promise uh, in in uh, in in developing and and also I mean with as as more data comes for 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 the data that we have which is at the country level so we get exposures of banks in a, the collective of banks in a certain jurisdictions vis a vis the collective of NBFIs in another jurisdiction uh, we have this bilaterally and and then in the future also more analysis can be can uh, can be done on this um, so yeah I think this is all I have to say thanks again yeah. and it's good to see you Loriana again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Inaki, and uh, also thank you, thanks again, Loriana, for this uh, very, very precise uh, screening of the, of the three different papers. I think the, 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 the more general issues that you raised, um, such as uh, who, who is served by all these different networks and whether there is complementarity or substitutability between the different uh networks uh, the, these are questions that that are really open for for further research research and uh, with that i hand over to catherine for final remarks catherine thank you very much reiner and uh thank you claudia for a great capstone um to our day um it's been a very full afternoon um and i i uh, congratulate everybody who's made it through um, I think it has been a very rich conference, and I really wanted to thank all the participants and panelists. Um, I wanted to make a few remarks, just drawing things together. Um, I posed the question, are international bank networks sources of stability or instability? Um, are they sources of resilience? Are they sources of spreading risk? Um, and of course, we haven't quite answered that really big question. But I think we have a few insights that I'd just like to draw out. Um, the first is that, um, all the papers are busy trying to observe, trying to reconstruct, trying to document those international bank networks. Um, and, and I think this is still an ongoing process. So even to ask the question requires this fundamental research still, um, which I think is an important observation. Um, we heard in terms of the papers, I think the two sessions work very well together. Um, the first uh, theme, perhaps, is the importance of non-bank uh, financial institutions, um, and we heard about those from Olivier Ekmanotti, from Mark Carlson, in part, about the securities markets and securities lending, um, and also, for, of course, from Inyaki with the um, contemporary data on those trends. So that relationship between international bank networks and non-bank financial intermediaries, I think, is crucial. Um, the second theme I brought out um, was the how how um, how crisis or how risk can be transferred through networks. So the route for the impact of cross-border flows um, is another theme that was brought up um, by Mark Carlson um, and also by Natasha Postelvine um, in their papers. Um, but also in part, I think Yaki is sort of hinting at it when he's looking at the, um, the links between bank and non-bank uh, financial intermediaries. And the final theme I wanted to bring out is about the architecture of international banking and these international bank networks and how they change over time. Um, and these, this was addressed in papers by, uh, by Getz, by uh, Wilfred, um, and indeed by Beatrice and her swaps. Um, and this is something that I'm really interested in. And I just wanted to pitch you my current project, which has just started last month, funded by the European Research Council. And it's a five-year study looking at that underpinning architecture of the international banking system, which is the international payment system across the 20th century um, by reconstructing laboriously uh, every bilateral banking relationship in the world um, from 1870 um, to 2000, so that we can see the dynamic changes that happen in response to crisis, in response to changes and shifts in economic growth and economic development, and also the changes in uh, 
uh, strategic conflict, but also in technology as those affect international and global payments over time. Um, so I wanted to just give you a kind of a, a little, uh, a little um, advertise, advertisement, I guess, um, of that future research, which I'm so excited to bring to Frankfurt uh, next year as the visiting professor. Um, I want to thank the Bankhaus Metzler and the Friedrich Flick uh, Foundation for supporting this, um, this visiting professorship and its patience in waiting for my ability to physically come there. I think it would not have worked um, to do it completely virtually. I really want to meet the students. I want to sit down and have coffee with Reiner um, and his colleagues at Getty University. Um, I want to go to the ECB. I want to go to the Bundesbank. I want to, uh, to meet uh, physically um, and build relationships with people in Frankfurt. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, the House of Finance um, and the International or the Institute for Banking and Financial History, with whom I've had an ongoing relationship and the Leibniz Institute for Financial Research, SAFE, uh, which sponsors uh, or helps with that uh, visiting professorship, but also with today's conference. Um, I wanted to thank Reiner Klump uh, for, uh, for stepping in to chair the second session. Um, and I, as I said, I really look forward to being his colleague, uh, not just virtually, but in reality uh, next year. And finally, I'd like to send out a special uh, thanks to Hannah Flotte Dejeuner and Daniela Dimitrova, um, who supported uh, this conference and kept us all in train, uh, all informed about what was going to be happening and publicized the conference so effectively that we got a really fantastic audience. So thank you to the audience also. Um, and with that, I'll say, go and have a relax. I wish I would, we were all going out for a drink just now, um, but next year perhaps. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>